Chapter One of Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Bel Ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter one poverty after changing his five franc piece georges du roi left the restaurant he twisted his moustache in military style and cast a rapid sweeping glance upon the diners among whom were three saleswomen an untidy music-teacher of uncertain age and two women with their husbands when he reached the sidewalk he paused to consider what route he should take it was the twenty-eighth of june and he had only three francs in his pocket to last him the remainder of the month that meant two dinners and no lunches or two lunches and no dinners according to choice as he pondered upon this unpleasant state of affairs he sauntered down rue notre dame de lorette preserving his military air and carriage and rudely jostled the people upon the streets in order to clear a path for himself he appeared to be hostile to the passers-by and even to the houses the entire city tall well-built fair with blue eyes a curled moustache hair naturally wavy and parted in the middle he recalled the hero of the popular romances it was one of those sultry parisian evenings when not a breath of air is stirring the sewers exhaled poisonous gases and the restaurants the disagreeable odours of cooking and of kindred smells porters in their shirt-sleeves astride their chairs smoked their pipes at the carriage gates and pedestrians strolled leisurely along hats in hand when georges du roi reached the boulevard he halted again undecided as to which road to choose finally he turned toward the madeleine and followed the tide of people the large well patronized cafes tempted du roi but were he to drink only two glasses of beer in an evening farewell to the meagre supper the following night yet he said to himself i will take a glass at the americain by jove i am thirsty he glanced at men seated at the tables men who could afford to slake their thirst and he scowled at them rascals he muttered if he could have caught one of them at a corner in the dark he would have choked him without a scruple he recalled the two years spent in africa and the manner in which he had extorted money from the arabs a smile hovered about his lips at the recollection of an escapade which had cost three men their lives a foray which had given his two comrades and himself seventy fowls two sheep money and something to laugh about for six months the culprits were never found indeed they were not sought for the arab being looked upon as the soldier's prey but in paris it was different 
there one could not commit such deeds with impunity he regretted that he had not remained where he was but he had hoped to improve his condition and for that reason he was in paris he passed the vaudeville and stopped at the café américain debating as to whether he should take that glass before deciding he glanced at a clock it was a quarter past nine he knew that when the beer was placed in front of him he would drink it and then what would he do at eleven o'clock so he walked on intending to go as far as the madeleine and return when he reached the place de l'opera a tall young man passed him whose face he fancied was familiar he followed him repeating where the deuce have i seen that fellow for a time he racked his brain in vain then suddenly he saw the same man but not so corpulent and more youthful attired in the uniform of a hussar he exclaimed wait forestier and hastening up to him laid his hand upon the man's shoulder the latter turned looked at him and said what do you want sir duroy began to laugh don't you remember me no not remember georges duroy of the sixth hussars forestier extended both hands ah my dear fellow how are you very well and how are you oh i am not very well i cough six months out of the twelve as a result of bronchitis contracted at bougival about the time of my return to paris four years ago but you look well forestier taking his former comrade's arm told him of his malady of the consultations the opinions and the advice of the doctors and of the difficulty of following their advice in his position they ordered him to spend the winter in the south but how could he he was married and was a journalist in a responsible editorial position i manage the political department on la vie francaise i report the doings of the senate for le salut and from time to time i write for la planete that is what i am doing duroy in surprise glanced at him he was very much changed formerly forestier had been thin giddy noisy and always in good spirits but three years of life in paris had made another man of him now he was stout and serious and his hair was grey on his temples although he could not number more than twenty-seven years forestier asked where are you going duroy replied nowhere in particular very well will you accompany me to the vie francaise where i have some proofs to correct and afterwards take a drink with me yes gladly they walked along arm in arm with that familiarity which exists between schoolmates and brother officers what are you doing in paris asked forestier duroy shrugged his shoulders dying of hunger simply when my time was up i came hither to make my fortune or rather to live in paris and for six months i have been employed in a railroad office at fifteen hundred francs a year forestier murmured hmm, that is not very much but what can i do answered duroy i am alone i know no one 
i have no recommendations the spirit is not lacking but the means are his companion looked at him from head to foot like a practical man who is examining a subject then he said in a tone of conviction you see my dear fellow all depends on assurance here a shrewd observing man can sometimes become a minister you must obtrude yourself and yet not ask anything but how is it you have not found anything better than a clerkship at the station du roy replied i hunted everywhere and found nothing else but i know where i can get three thousand francs at least as riding-master at the pellerin school forestier stopped him don't do it for you can earn ten thousand francs you will ruin your prospects at once in your office at least no one knows you you could leave it if you wish at any time but when you are once a riding master all will be over you might as well be a butler in a house to which all paris comes to dine when you have given riding lessons to men of the world or to their sons they will no longer consider you their equal he paused reflected several seconds and then asked are you a bachelor yes though i have been smitten several times that makes no difference if cicero and tiberius were mentioned would you know who they were yes good no one knows any more except about a score of fools it is not difficult to pass for being learned the secret is not to betray your ignorance just manoeuvre avoid the quicksands and obstacles and the rest can be found in a dictionary he spoke like one who understood human nature and he smiled as the crowd passed them by suddenly he began to cough and stopped to allow the paroxysm to spend itself then he said in a discouraged tone <coughs> isn't it tiresome not to be able to get rid of this bronchitis and here is midsummer this winter i shall go to menton health before everything they reached the boulevard poissonniere behind a large glass door an open paper was affixed three people were reading it above the door was printed the legend la vie francaise forestier pushed open the door and said come in du roy entered they ascended the stairs passed through an antechamber in which two clerks greeted their comrade and then entered a kind of waiting-room sit down said forestier i shall be back in five minutes and he disappeared du roy remained where he was from time to time men passed him by entering by one door and going out by another before he had time to glance at them now they were young men very young with a busy air holding sheets of paper in their hands now compositors their shirts spotted with ink carefully carrying what were evidently fresh proofs occasionally a gentleman entered fashionably dressed some reporter bringing news forestier reappeared arm in arm with a tall thin man of thirty or forty dressed in a black coat with a white cravat a dark complexion and an insolent self-satisfied air forestier said to him 
adieu my dear sir and the other pressed his hand with au revoir my friend then he descended the stairs whistling his cane under his arm duroy asked his name that is jacques rival the celebrated writer and duellist he came to correct his proofs garin montel and he are the best witty and realistic writers we have in paris he earns thirty thousand francs a year for two articles a week as they went downstairs they met a stout little man with long hair who was ascending the stairs whistling forestier bowed low norbert de varenne said he the poet the author of les soleils morts a very expensive man every poem he gives us costs three hundred francs and the longest has not two hundred lines but let us go into the napolitain i am getting thirsty when they were seated at a table forestier ordered two glasses of beer he emptied his at a single draught while duroy sipped his beer slowly as if it were something rare and precious suddenly his companion asked why don't you try journalism duroy looked at him in surprise and said because i have never written anything bah we all have to make a beginning i could employ you myself by sending you to obtain information at first you would only get two hundred and fifty francs a month but your cab fare would be paid shall i speak to the manager if you will well then come and dine with me to-morrow i will only ask five or six to meet you the manager m walter his wife with jacques rival and norbert de varenne whom you have just seen and also a friend of madame forestier will you come duroy hesitated blushing and perplexed finally he murmured i have no suitable clothes forestier was amazed you have no dress suit he cared that is indispensable in paris it is better to have no bed than no clothes then fumbling in his vest pocket he drew from it two louis placed them before his companion and said kindly you can repay me when it is convenient buy yourself what you need and pay an instalment on it and come and dine with us at half past seven at seventeen rue fontaine in confusion duroy picked up the money and stammered you are very kind i am much obliged be sure i shall not forget forestier interrupted him that's all right take another glass of beer waiter two more glasses when he had paid the score the journalist asked would you like a stroll for an hour certainly they turned toward the madeleine what shall we do asked forestier they say that in paris an idler can always find amusement but it is not true a turn in the bois is only enjoyable if you have a lady with you and that is a rare occurrence the cafe concert may divert my tailor and his wife but they do not interest me so what can we do nothing there ought to be a summer garden here open at night where a man could listen to good music while drinking beneath the trees it would be a pleasant lounging place 
you could walk in alleys bright with electric light and seat yourself where you pleased to hear the music it would be charming where would you like to go duroy did not know what to reply finally he said i have never been to the folie bergere i should like to go there his companion exclaimed the folie bergere very well they turned and walked toward the faubourg montmartre the brilliantly illuminated building loomed up before them forestier entered duroy stopped him we forgot to pass through the gate the other replied in a consequential tone i never pay and approached the box office have you a good box certainly monsieur forestier he took the ticket handed him pushed open the door and they were within the hall a cloud of tobacco smoke almost hid the stage and the opposite side of the theatre in the spacious foyer which led to the circular promenade brilliantly dressed women mingled with black-coated men forestier forced his way rapidly through the throng and accosted an usher box seventeen this way sir the friends were shown into a tiny box hung and carpeted in red with four chairs upholstered in the same colour they seated themselves to their right and left were similar boxes on the stage three men were performing on trapezes but duroy paid no heed to them his eyes finding more to interest them in the grand promenade forestier remarked upon the motley appearance of the throng but duroy did not listen to him a woman leaning her arms upon the edge of her loge was staring at him she was a tall voluptuous brunette her face whitened with enamel her black eyes pencilled and her lips painted with a movement of her head she summoned a friend who was passing a blonde with auburn hair likewise inclined to embonpoint and said to her in a whisper intended to be heard there is a nice fellow forestier heard it and said to duroy with a smile you are lucky my dear boy my congratulations the ci-devant soldier blushed and mechanically fingered the two pieces of gold in his pocket the curtain fell the orchestra played a valse and duroy said shall we walk around the gallery if you like soon they were carried along in the current of promenaders duroy drank in with delight the air vitiated as it was by tobacco and cheap perfume but forestier perspired panted and coughed <coughs> let us go into the garden he said turning to the left they entered a kind of covered garden in which two large fountains were playing under the yews men and women sat at tables drinking another glass of beer asked forestier gladly they took their seats and watched the promenaders occasionally a woman would stop and ask with a coarse smile what have you to offer sir forestier's invariable answer was a glass of water from the fountain and the woman would mutter go along and walk away at last the brunette reappeared 
arm in arm with the blonde. They made a handsome couple. The former smiled on perceiving du roi, and taking a chair she calmly seated herself in front of him, and said in a clear voice, Waiter, two glasses. In astonishment Forestier exclaimed, You are not at all bashful. She replied, Your friend has bewitched me. He is such a fine fellow. I believe he has turned my head. Du Roy said nothing. The waiter brought the beer, which the women swallowed rapidly. Then they rose, and the brunette, nodding her head and tapping Du Roy's arm with her fan, said to him, Thank you, my dear. However, you are not very talkative. As they disappeared, Forestier laughed and said, <laughs> Tell me, old man, did you know that you had a charm for the weaker sex? You must be careful. Without replying, Du Roy smiled. His friend asked, Shall you remain any longer? I am going. I have had enough. Georges murmured, Yes, I will stay a little longer. It is not late. Forestier arose. Very well, then. Good-bye until to-morrow. Do not forget. Seventeen Rue Fontaine at seven-thirty. I shall not forget. Thank you. The two friends shook hands, and the journalist left Du Roy to his own devices. Forestier once out of sight, Du Roy felt free, and again he joyously touched the gold pieces in his pocket. Then rising, he mingled with the crowd. He soon discovered the blonde and the brunette. He went towards them but when near them dared not address them. The brunette called out to him, Have you found your tongue? He stammered, Soons, too bashful to say another word. A pause ensued, during which the brunette took his arm, and together they left the hall. End of section one. Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter two of Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel, by Guy de Maupassant. Translator Unknown. Chapter Two. Madame Forestier. Where does Monsieur Forestier live? Third floor on the left, said the porter pleasantly, on learning Du Roy's destination. Georges ascended the staircase. He was somewhat embarrassed and ill at ease. He had on a new suit, but he was uncomfortable. He felt that it was defective. His boots were not glossy. He had bought his shirt that same evening at the Louvre for four francs fifty. His trousers were too wide, and betrayed their cheapness in their fit, or rather misfit, and his coat was too tight. Slowly he ascended the stairs, his heart beating, his mind anxious. Suddenly before him stood a well-dressed gentleman staring at him. The person resembled Du Roy, so close that the latter retreated, then stopped, 
and saw that it was his own image reflected in a pier-glass not having anything but a small mirror at home he had not been able to see himself entirely and had exaggerated the imperfections of his toilette when he saw his reflection in the glass he did not even recognize himself he took himself for someone else for a man of the world and was really satisfied with his general appearance smiling to himself duroy extended his hand and expressed his astonishment pleasure and approbation a door opened on the staircase he was afraid of being surprised and began to ascend more rapidly fearing that he might have been seen posing there by some of his friends invited guests on reaching the second floor he saw another mirror and once more slackened his pace to look at himself he likewise paused before the third glass twirled his moustache took off his hat to arrange his hair and murmured half aloud a habit of his all mirrors are most convenient then he rang the bell the door opened almost immediately and before him stood a servant in a black coat with a grave shaven face so perfect in his appearance that duroy again became confused as he compared the cut of their garments the lackey asked whom shall i announce monsieur he raised a portiere and pronounced the name duroy lost his self-possession upon being ushered into a world as yet strange to him however he advanced a young fair woman received him alone in a large well-lighted room he paused disconcerted who was this smiling lady he remembered that forestier was married and the thought that the handsome blonde was his friend's wife rendered him awkward and ill at ease he stammered out madame i am she held out her hand i know monsieur charles told me of your meeting last night and i am very glad that he asked you to dine with us to-day duroy blushed to the roots of his hair not knowing how to reply he felt that he was being inspected from his head to his feet he half thought of excusing himself of inventing an explanation of the carelessness of his toilette but he did not know how to touch upon that delicate subject he seated himself upon a chair she pointed out to him and as he sank into its luxurious depths it seemed to him that he was entering a new and charming life that he would make his mark in the world that he was saved he glanced at madame forestier she wore a gown of pale blue cashmere which clung gracefully to her supple form and rounded outlines her arms and throat rose in lily-white purity from the mass of lace which ornamented the corsage and short sleeves her hair was dressed high and curled upon the nape of her neck duroy grew more at his ease under her glance which recalled to him he knew not why that of the girl he had met the preceding evening at the folie bergere madame forestier had grey eyes a small nose full lips and a rather heavy chin an irregular attractive face full of gentleness 
and yet of malice after a short silence she asked have you been in paris a long time gradually regaining his self-possession he replied a few months madame i am in the railroad employ but my friend forestier has encouraged me to hope that thanks to him i can enter into journalism she smiled kindly and murmured in a low voice i know the bell rang again and the servant announced madame de marelle she was a dainty brunette attired in a simple dark robe a red rose in her black tresses seemed to accentuate her special character and a young girl or rather a child for such she was followed her madame forestier said good evening clotilde good evening madeleine they embraced each other then the child offered her forehead with the assurance of an adult saying good evening cousin madame forestier kissed her and then made the introductions monsieur georges du roi an old friend of charles madame de marelle my friend a relative in fact she added here you know we do not stand on ceremony du roi bowed the door opened again and a short man entered upon his arm a tall handsome woman taller than he and much younger with distinguished manners and a dignified carriage it was monsieur walter deputy financier a moneyed man and a man of business manager of la vie francaise with his wife née basile ravalade daughter of the banker of that name then came jacques rival very elegant followed by norbert de varenne the latter advanced with the grace of the old school and taking madame forestier's hand kissed it his long hair falling upon his hostess's bare arm as he did so forestier now entered apologizing for being late he had been detained the servant announced dinner and they entered the dining-room du roi was placed between madame de marelle and her daughter he was again rendered uncomfortable for fear of committing some error in the conventional management of his fork his spoon or of his glasses of which he had four nothing was said during the soup then norbert de varenne asked a general question have you read the gautier case how droll it was then followed a discussion of the subject in which the ladies joined then a duel was mentioned and jacques rival led the conversation that was his province du roi did not venture a remark but occasionally glanced at his neighbour a diamond upon a slight golden thread depended from her ear from time to time she uttered a remark which evoked a smile upon his lips du roi sought vainly for some compliment to pay her he busied himself with her daughter filled her glass waited upon her and the child more dignified than her mother thanked him gravely saying you are very kind monsieur while she listened to the conversation with a reflective air the dinner was excellent and every one was delighted with it the conversation returned to the colonization of algeria m walter uttered several jocose remarks forestier alluded to the article he had prepared for the morrow 
jacques rival declared himself in favour of a military government with grants of land to all the officers after thirty years of colonial service in that way said he you can establish a strong colony familiar with and liking the country knowing its language and able to cope with all those local yet grave questions which invariably confront newcomers norbert de varenne interrupted yes they would know everything except agriculture they would speak arabic but they would not know how to transplant beetroot and how to sow wheat they would be strong in fencing but weak in the art of farming on the contrary the new country should be opened up to every one intelligent men would make positions for themselves the others would succumb it is a natural law a pause ensued every one smiled georges du roy startled at the sound of his own voice as if he had never heard it said what is needed the most down there is good soil really fertile land costs as much as it does in france and is bought by wealthy parisians the real colonists the poor are generally cast out into the desert where nothing grows for lack of water all eyes turned upon him he coloured monsieur walter asked do you know algeria sir he replied yes sir i was there twenty-eight months leaving the subject of colonization norbert de varenne questioned him as to some of the algerian customs georges spoke with animation excited by the wine and the desire to please he related anecdotes of the regiment of arabian life and of the war madame walter murmured to him in her soft tones you could write a series of charming articles forestier took advantage of the situation to say to m walter my dear sir i spoke to you a short while since of m georges du roy and asked you to permit me to include him on the staff of political reporters since marambot has left us i have had no one to take urgent and confidential reports and the paper is suffering by it m walter put on his spectacles in order to examine du roy then he said i am convinced that m du roy is original and if he will call upon me to-morrow at three o'clock we will arrange matters after a pause turning to the young man he said you may write us a short sketch on algeria monsieur du roy simply relate your experiences i am sure they will interest our readers but you must do it quickly madame walter added with her customary serious grace you will have a charming title souvenirs of a soldier in africa will he not monsieur norbert the old poet who had attained renown late in life disliked and mistrusted newcomers he replied dryly yes excellent provided that it is written in the right key for there lies the great difficulty madame forestier cast upon du roy a protecting and smiling glance which seemed to say you shall succeed the servant filled the glasses with wine and forestier proposed the toast 
to the long prosperity of la vie francaise duroy felt superhuman strength within him infinite hope and invincible resolution he was at his ease now among these people his eyes rested upon their faces with renewed assurance and for the first time he ventured to address his neighbour you have the most beautiful earrings i have ever seen she turned towards him with a smile it is a fancy of mine to wear diamonds like this simply on a thread he murmured in reply trembling at his audacity it is charming but the ear increases the beauty of the ornament she thanked him with a glance as he turned his head he met madame forestier's eyes in which he fancied he saw a mingled expression of gaiety malice and encouragement all the men were talking at the same time their discussion was animated when the party left the dining-room duroy offered his arm to the little girl she thanked him gravely and stood upon tiptoe in order to lay her hand upon his arm upon entering the drawing-room the young man carefully surveyed it it was not a large room but there were no bright colours and one felt at ease it was restful the walls were draped with violet hangings covered with tiny embroidered flowers of yellow silk the portieres were of a greyish blue and the chairs were of all shapes of all sizes scattered about the room were couches and large and small easy chairs all covered with louis xvi's brocade or utrecht velvet a cream-coloured ground with garnet flowers do you take coffee monsieur du roi madame forestier offered him a cup with the smile that was always on her lips yes madame thank you he took the cup and as he did so the young woman whispered to him pay madame walter some attention then she vanished before he could reply first he drank his coffee which he feared he should let fall upon the carpet then he sought a pretext for approaching the manager's wife and commencing a conversation suddenly he perceived that she held an empty cup in her hand and as she was not near a table she did not know where to put it he rushed toward her allow me madame thank you sir he took away the cup and returned if you but knew madame what pleasant moments la vie francaise afforded me when i was in the desert it is indeed the only paper one cares to read outside of france it contains everything she smiled with amiable indifference as she replied monsieur walter had a great deal of trouble in producing the kind of journal which was required they talked of paris the suburbs the seine the delights of summer of everything they could think of finally monsieur norbert de varenne advanced a glass of liqueur in his hand and duroy discreetly withdrew madame de marelle who was chatting with her hostess called him so sir she said bluntly you are going to try journalism that question led to a renewal of the interrupted conversation with madame walter in her turn madame de marelle related anecdotes and becoming familiar laid her hand upon duroy's arm he felt that he would like to devote himself to her 
to protect her and the slowness with which he replied to her questions indicated his preoccupation suddenly without any cause madame de marelle called laurine and the girl came to her sit down here my child you will be cold near the window du roy was seized with an eager desire to embrace the child as if part of that embrace would revert to the mother he asked in a gallant yet paternal tone will you permit me to kiss you mademoiselle the child raised her eyes with an air of surprise madame de marelle said with a smile reply i will allow you to-day monsieur but not all the time seating himself du roy took laurine on his knee and kissed her lips and her fine wavy hair her mother was surprised well that is strange ordinarily she only allows ladies to caress her you are irresistible monsieur du roy coloured but did not reply when madame forestier joined them a cry of astonishment escaped her well laurine has become sociable what a miracle the young man rose to take his leave fearing he might spoil his conquest by some awkward word he bowed to the ladies clasped and gently pressed their hands and then shook hands with the men he observed that jacques rival's was dry and warm and responded cordially to his pressure norbert de varennes was moist and cold and slipped through his fingers walter's was cold and soft without life expressionless forestier's fat and warm his friend whispered to him to-morrow at three o'clock do not forget never fear when he reached the staircase he felt like running down his joy was so great he went down two steps at a time but suddenly on the second floor in the large mirror he saw a gentleman hurrying on and he slackened his pace as much ashamed as if he had been surprised in a crime he surveyed himself some time with a complacent smile then taking leave of his image he bowed low ceremoniously as if saluting some grand personage End of chapter 2 Recording by Martin Giessen In Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 3 of Belle Amie, or The History of a Scoundrel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen Belle Amie, or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter three first attempts when georges du roy reached the street he hesitated as to what he should do he felt inclined to stroll along dreaming of the future and inhaling the soft night air but the thought of the series of articles ordered by m walter occurred to him and he decided to return home at once and begin work he walked rapidly along until he came to rue bourseau the tenement in which he lived was occupied by twenty families families of working men and as he mounted the staircase 
he experienced a sensation of disgust and a desire to live as wealthy men do duroy's room was on the fifth floor he entered it opened his window and looked out the view was anything but prepossessing he turned away thinking this won't do i must go to work so he placed his light upon the table and began to write he dipped his pen into the ink and wrote at the head of his paper in a bold hand souvenirs of a soldier in africa then he cast about for the first phrase he rested his head upon his hand and stared at the blank sheet before him what should he say suddenly he thought i must begin with my departure and he wrote in eighteen seventy four about the fifteenth of may when exhausted france was recruiting after the catastrophe of the terrible years here he stopped short not knowing how to introduce his subject after a few minutes reflection he decided to lay aside that page until the following day and to write a description of algiers he began algiers is a very clean city but he could not continue after an effort he added it is inhabited partly by arabs then he threw his pen upon the table and arose he glanced around his miserable room mentally he rebelled against his poverty and resolved to leave the next day suddenly the desire to work came on him and he tried to begin the article again he had vague ideas of what he wanted to say but he could not express his thoughts in words convinced of his inability he arose once more his blood coursing rapidly through his veins he turned to the window just as the train was coming out of the tunnel and his thoughts reverted to his parents he saw their tiny home on the heights overlooking rouen and the valley of the seine his father and mother kept an inn la belle vue at which the citizens of the faubourgs took their lunches on sundays they had wished to make a gentleman of their son and had sent him to college his studies completed he had entered the army with the intention of becoming an officer a colonel or a general but becoming disgusted with military life he determined to try his fortune in paris when his time of service had expired he went thither with what results we have seen he awoke from his reflections as the locomotive whistled shrilly closed his window and began to disrobe muttering Pah, i shall be able to work better to-morrow morning my brain is not clear to-night i have drunk a little too much i can't work well under such circumstances he extinguished his light and fell asleep he awoke early and rising opened his window to inhale the fresh air in a few moments he seated himself at his table dipped his pen in the ink rested his head upon his hand and thought but in vain however he was not discouraged but in thought reassured himself bah, i am not accustomed to it it is a profession that must be learned like all professions 
someone must help me the first time i'll go to forestier he'll start my article for me in ten minutes when he reached the street duroy decided that it was rather early to present himself at his friend's house so he strolled along under the trees on one of the boulevards for a time on arriving at forestier's door he found his friend going out you here at this hour can i do anything for you duroy stammered in confusion i i cannot write that article on algeria that m walter wants it is not very surprising seeing that i have never written anything it requires practice i could write very rapidly i am sure if i could make a beginning i have the ideas but i cannot express them he paused and hesitated forestier smiled maliciously i understand that duroy continued yes anyone is liable to have that trouble at the beginning and well i have come to ask you to help me in ten minutes you can set me right you can give me a lesson in style without you i can do nothing the other smiled gaily he patted his companion's arm and said to him go to my wife she will help you better than i can i have trained her for that work i have not time this morning or i would do it willingly but duroy hesitated at this hour i cannot inquire for her oh yes you can she has risen you will find her in my study i will go but i shall tell her you sent me forestier walked away and duroy slowly ascended the stairs wondering what he should say and what kind of a reception he would receive the servant who opened the door said monsieur has gone out duroy replied ask madame forestier if she will see me and tell her that monsieur forestier whom i met on the street sent me the lackey soon returned and ushered duroy into madame's presence she was seated at a table and extended her hand to him so soon said she it was not a reproach but a simple question he stammered i did not want to come up madame but your husband whom i met below insisted i dare scarcely tell you my errand i worked late last night and early this morning to write the article on algeria which m walter wants and i did not succeed i destroyed all my attempts i am not accustomed to the work and i came to ask forestier to assist me this once she interrupted with a laugh and he sent you to me yes madame he said you could help me better than he but i dared not i did not like to she rose it will be delightful to work together that way i am charmed with your idea wait take my chair for they know my handwriting on the paper we will write a successful article she took a cigarette from the mantelpiece and lighted it i cannot work without smoking she said what are you going to say he looked at her in astonishment i do not know i came here to find that out she replied i will manage it all right i will make the sauce but i must have the dish she questioned him in detail and finally said now we will begin 
first of all we will suppose that you are addressing a friend which will allow us scope for remarks of all kinds begin this way my dear henry you wish to know something about algeria you shall then followed a brilliantly worded description of algeria and of the port of algiers an excursion to the province of oran a visit to saida and an adventure with a pretty spanish maid employed in a factory when the article was concluded he could find no words of thanks he was happy to be near her grateful for and delighted with their growing intimacy it seemed to him that everything about him was a part of her even to the books upon the shelves the chairs the furniture the air all were permeated with that delightful fragrance peculiar to her she asked bluntly what do you think of my friend madame de marelle i think her very fascinating he said and he would have liked to add but not as much so as you he had not the courage to do so she continued if you only knew how comical original and intelligent she is she is a true bohemian it is for that reason that her husband no longer loves her he only sees her defects and none of her good qualities duroy was surprised to hear that madame de marelle was married what he asked is she married what does her husband do madame forestier shrugged her shoulders oh he is superintendent of a railroad he is in paris a week out of each month his wife calls it holy week or the week of duty when you get better acquainted with her you will see how witty she is come here and see her some day as she spoke the door opened noiselessly and a gentleman entered unannounced he halted on seeing a man for a moment madame forestier seemed confused then she said in a natural voice though her cheeks were tinged with a blush come in my dear sir allow me to present to you an old comrade of charles monsieur georges duroy a future journalist then in a different tone she said our best and dearest friend count de vaudrec the two men bowed gazed into one another's eyes and then duroy took his leave neither tried to detain him on reaching the street he felt sad and uncomfortable count de vaudrec's face was constantly before him it seemed to him that the man was displeased at finding him tete-a-tete -tete with madame forestier though why he should be he could not divine to while away the time until three o'clock he lunched at duval's and then lounged along the boulevard when the clock chimed the hour of his appointment he climbed the stairs leading to the office of la vie francaise duroy asked is monsieur walter in monsieur walter is engaged was the reply will you please take a seat duroy waited twenty minutes then he turned to the clerk and said monsieur walter had an appointment with me at three o'clock at any rate see if my friend monsieur forestier is here he was conducted along a corridor and ushered into a large room in which four men were writing at a table 
forestier was standing before the fireplace smoking a cigarette after listening to duroy's story he said come with me i will take you to monsieur walter or else you might remain here until seven o'clock they entered the manager's room norbert de varenne was writing an article seated in an easy chair jacques rival stretched upon a divan was smoking a cigar the room had the peculiar odour familiar to all journalists when they approached m walter forestier said here is my friend duroy the manager looked keenly at the young man and asked have you brought my article duroy drew the sheets of manuscript from his pocket here they are monsieur the manager seemed delighted and said with a smile very good you are a man of your word need i look over it forestier but forestier hastened to reply it is not necessary monsieur walter i helped him in order to initiate him into the profession it is very good then bending towards him he whispered you know you promised to engage du roi to replace marambeau will you allow me to retain him on the same terms certainly taking his friend's arm the journalist drew him away while m walter returned to the game of écarté he had been engaged in when they entered forestier and du roi returned to the room in which georges had found his friend the latter said to his new reporter you must come here every day at three o'clock and i will tell you what places to go to first of all i shall give you a letter of introduction to the chief of the police who will in turn introduce you to one of his employees you can arrange with him for all important news official and semi-official for details you can apply to saint potin who is posted you will see him to-morrow above all you must learn to make your way everywhere in spite of closed doors you will receive two hundred francs a month two sous a line for original matter and two sous a line for articles you are ordered to write on different subjects what shall i do to-day asked duroy i have no work for you to-day you can go if you wish to and our our article oh do not worry about it i will correct the proofs do the rest to-morrow and come here at three o'clock as you did to-day and after shaking hands duroy descended the staircase with a light heart End of chapter three. Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter four of Bel Ami or the History of a Scoundrel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Bel Ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter four du roi learns something georges du roi did not sleep well so anxious was he to see his article in print he rose at daybreak and was on the street long before the newsboys when he secured a paper and saw his name at the end of a column in large letters he became very much excited 
he felt inclined to enact the part of a newsboy and cry out to the hurrying throng buy this it contains an article by me he strolled along to a cafe and seated himself in order to read the article through that done he decided to go to the railroad office draw his salary and hand in his resignation with great pomposity he informed the chief clerk that he was on the staff of la vie francaise and by that means was avenged for many petty insults which had been offered him he then had some cards written with his new calling beneath his name made several purchases and repaired to the office of la vie francaise forestier received him loftily as one would an inferior ah here you are very well i have several things for you to do just wait ten minutes till i finish this work he continued writing at the other end of the table sat a short pale man very stout and bald forestier asked him when his letter was completed saint potin at what time shall you interview those people at four o'clock take du roy who is here with you and initiate him into the business very well then turning to his friend forestier added have you brought the other paper on algeria the article this morning was very successful du roy stammered no i thought i should have time this afternoon i had so much to do i could not the other shrugged his shoulders <sighs> if you are not more careful you will spoil your future monsieur walter counted on your copy i will tell him it will be ready to-morrow if you think you will be paid for doing nothing you are mistaken after a pause he added you should strike while the iron is hot saint potin rose i am ready said he forestier turned around in his chair and said to du roy listen the chinese general li teng fao stopping at the continental and raja tapo sahib rama de rao pali stopping at hotel bishop have been in paris two days you must interview them addressing saint potin he said do not forget the principal points i indicated to you ask the general and the raja their opinions on the dealings of england in the extreme east their ideas of their system of colonization and government their hopes relative to the intervention of europe and of france in particular to du roy he said observe what saint potin says he is an excellent reporter and try to learn how to draw out a man in five minutes then he resumed his work the two men walked down the boulevard together while saint potin gave du roy a sketch of all the officials connected with the paper sparing no one in his criticism when he mentioned forestier he said as for him he was fortunate in marrying his wife du roy asked what about his wife saint potin rubbed his hands oh she is beloved by an old fellow named vaudrec he dotes upon her du roy felt as if he would like to box saint potin's ears to change the subject he said it seems to me that it is late and we have two noble lords to call upon saint potin laughed you are very innocent do you think that i am going to interview that chinese and that indian 
as if i did not know better than they do what they should think to please the readers of la vie francaise i have interviewed five hundred chinese prussians hindus chileans and japanese they all say the same thing i need only copy my article on the last comer word for word changing the heading names titles and ages in that there must be no error or i shall be hauled over the coals by the figaro or gaulois but on that subject the porter of the hotels will post me in five minutes we will smoke our cigars and stroll in that direction total one hundred sous for cab fare that is the way my dear fellow when they arrived at the madeleine saint potin said to his companion if you have anything to do i do not need you du roy shook hands with him and walked away the thought of the article he had to write that evening haunted him mentally he collected the material as he wended his way to the cafe at which he dined then he returned home and seated himself at his table to work before his eyes was the sheet of blank paper but all the material he had amassed had escaped him after trying for an hour and after filling five pages with sentences which had no connection one with the other he said i am not yet familiar with the work i must take another lesson at ten o'clock the following morning he rang the bell at his friend's house the servant who opened the door said monsieur is busy duroy had not expected to find forestier at home however he said tell him it is monsieur duroy on important business in the course of five minutes he was ushered into the room in which he had spent so happy a morning in the place madame forestier had occupied her husband was seated writing while madame forestier stood by the mantelpiece and dictated to him a cigarette between her lips duroy paused upon the threshold and murmured i beg your pardon i am interrupting you his friend growled angrily what do you want again make haste we are busy georges stammered it is nothing but forestier persisted come we are losing time you did not force your way into the house for the pleasure of bidding us good morning duroy in confusion replied no it is this i cannot complete my article and you were so so kind the last time that i hoped that i dared to come forestier interrupted with so you think i will do your work and that you have only to take the money well that is fine his wife smoked on without interfering duroy hesitated excuse me i believed i thought then in a clear voice he said i beg a thousand pardons madame and thank you very much for the charming article you wrote for me yesterday then he bowed and said to charles i will be at the office at three o'clock he returned home saying to himself very well i will write it alone and they shall see scarcely had he entered than he began to write anger spurring him on in an hour he had finished an article which was a chaos of absurd matter and took it boldly to the office duroy handed forestier his manuscript 
here is the rest of algeria very well i will hand it to the manager that will do when duroy and saint potin who had some political information to look up were in the hall the latter asked have you been to the cashier's room no why why to get your pay you should always get your salary a month in advance one cannot tell what might happen i will introduce you to the cashier duroy drew his two hundred francs together with twenty-eight francs for his article of the preceding day which in addition to what remained to him of his salary from the railroad office left him three hundred and forty francs he had never had so much and he thought himself rich for an indefinite time saint potin took him to the offices of four or five rival papers hoping that the news he had been commissioned to obtain had been already received by them and that he could obtain it by means of his diplomacy when evening came duroy who had nothing more to do turned toward the folie bergere and walking up to the office he said my name is georges duroy i am on the staff of la vie francaise i was here the other night with m forestier who promised to get me a pass i do not know if he remembered it the register was consulted but his name was not inscribed upon it however the cashier a very affable man said to him come in monsieur duroy and speak to the manager yourself he will see that everything is all right he entered and almost at once came upon rachel the woman he had seen there before she approached him good evening my dear are you well very well how are you i am not ill i have dreamed of you twice since the other night duroy smiled what does that mean that means that i like you she raised her eyes to the young man's face took his arm and leaning upon it said let us drink a glass of wine and then take a walk i should like to go to the opera like this with you to show you off at daybreak he again sallied forth to obtain a vie francaise he opened the paper feverishly his article was not there on entering the office several hours later he said to m walter i was very much surprised this morning not to see my second article on algeria the manager raised his head and said sharply i gave it to your friend forestier and asked him to read it he was dissatisfied with it it will have to be done over without a word duroy left the room and entering his friend's office brusquely asked why did not my article appear this morning the journalist who was smoking a cigar said calmly the manager did not consider it good and bade me return it to you to be revised there it is duroy revised it several times only to have it rejected he said nothing more of his souvenirs but gave his whole attention to reporting he became acquainted behind the scenes at the theatres and in the halls and corridors of the chamber of deputies he knew all the cabinet ministers generals police agents princes ambassadors men of the world greeks cabmen waiters at cafes and many others 
in short he soon became a remarkable reporter of great value to the paper so m walter said but as he only received ten centimes a line in addition to his fixed salary of two hundred francs and as his expenses were large he never had a sou when he saw certain of his associates with their pockets full of money he wondered what secret means they employed in order to obtain it he determined to penetrate that mystery to enter into the association to obtrude himself upon his comrades and make them share with him often at evening as he watched the trains pass his window he dreamed of the conduct he might pursue end of chapter four recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter five part one of bel ami or the history of a scoundrel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter five the first intrigue part one two months elapsed it was september the fortune which duroy had hoped to make so rapidly seemed to him slow in coming above all he was dissatisfied with the mediocrity of his position he was appreciated but was treated according to his rank forestier himself no longer invited him to dinner and treated him as an inferior often he had thought of making madame forestier a visit but the remembrance of their last meeting restrained him madame de marelle had invited him to call saying i am always at home about three o'clock so one afternoon when he had nothing to do he proceeded toward her house she lived on rue verneuil on the fourth floor a maid answered his summons and said yes madame is at home but i do not know whether she has risen she conducted duroy into the drawing-room which was large poorly furnished and somewhat untidy the shabby threadbare chairs were ranged along the walls according to the servant's fancy for there was not a trace visible of the care of a woman who loves her home duroy took a seat and waited some time then a door opened and madame de marelle entered hastily clad in a japanese dressing-gown she exclaimed how kind of you to come to see me i was positive you had forgotten me she held out her hand to him with a gesture of delight and duroy quite at his ease in that shabby apartment kissed it as he had seen norbert de varenne do examining him from head to foot she cried how you have changed well tell me the news they began to chat at once as if they were old acquaintances and in five minutes an intimacy a mutual understanding was established between those two beings alike in character and kind suddenly the young woman said in surprise it is astonishing how i feel with you it seems to me as if i had known you ten years we shall undoubtedly become good friends would that please you he replied certainly 
with a smile more expressive than words he thought her very bewitching in her pretty gown when near madame forestier whose impassive gracious smile attracted yet held at a distance and seemed to say i like you yet take care he felt a desire to cast himself at her feet or to kiss the hem of her garment when near madame de marel he felt a more passionate desire a gentle rap came at the door through which madame de marel had entered and she cried you may come in my darling the child entered advanced to du roi and offered him her hand the astonished mother murmured that is a conquest the young man having kissed the child seated her by his side and with a serious air questioned her as to what she had done since they last met she replied in a flute-like voice and with the manner of a woman the clock struck three the journalist rose come often said madame de marel it has been a pleasant causerie i shall always be glad to welcome you why do i never meet you at the forestiers for no particular reason i am very busy i hope however that we shall meet there one of these days in the course of a few days he paid another visit to the enchantress the maid ushered him into the drawing-room and laurine soon entered she offered him not her hand but her forehead and said mamma wishes me to ask you to wait for her for about fifteen minutes for she is not dressed i will keep you company du roi who was amused at the child's ceremonious manner replied indeed mademoiselle i shall be enchanted to spend a quarter of an hour with you when the mother entered they were in the midst of an exciting game and madame de marel paused in amazement crying laurine playing you are a sorcerer sir he placed the child whom he had caught in his arms upon the floor kissed the lady's hand and they seated themselves the child between them they tried to converse but laurine usually so silent monopolized the conversation and her mother was compelled to send her to her room when they were alone madame de marel lowered her voice and said i have a great project it is this as i dine every week at the forestiers i return it from time to time by inviting them to a restaurant i do not like to have company at home i am not so situated that i can have any i know nothing about housekeeping or cooking i prefer a life free from care therefore i invite them to the cafe occasionally but it is not lively when we are only three i am telling you this in order to explain such an informal gathering i should like you to be present at our saturdays at the cafe riche at seven thirty do you know the house du roi accepted gladly he left her in a transport of delight and impatiently awaited the day of the dinner he was the first to arrive at the place appointed and was shown into a small private room in which the table was laid for four that table looked very inviting with its coloured glasses silver and candelabra duroy seated himself upon a low bench forestier entered and shook hands with him with a cordiality he never evinced at the office the two ladies will come together said he 
these dinners are truly delightful very soon the door opened and mesdames forestier and de marelle appeared heavily veiled surrounded by the charming mystery necessary to a rendezvous in a place so public as duroy greeted the former she took him to task for not having been to see her then she added with a smile ah you prefer madame de marelle the time passes more pleasantly with her when the waiter handed the wine list to forestier madame de marelle exclaimed bring the gentlemen whatever they want as for us we want nothing but champagne forestier who seemed not to have heard her asked do you object to my closing the window my cough has troubled me for several days not at all his wife did not speak the various courses were duly served and then the guests began to chat they discussed a scandal which was being circulated about a society bell forestier was very much amused by it duroy said with a smile how many would abandon themselves to a caprice a dream of love if they did not fear that they would pay for a brief happiness with tears and an irremediable scandal both women glanced at him approvingly forestier cried with a sceptical laugh the poor husbands then they talked of love duroy said when i love a woman everything else in the world is forgotten madame forestier murmured there is no happiness comparable to that first clasp of the hand when one asks do you love me and the other replies yes i love you madame de marelle cried gaily as she drank a glass of champagne i am less platonic forestier lying upon the couch said in a serious tone that frankness does you honour and proves you to be a practical woman but might one ask what is monsieur de marelle's opinion she shrugged her shoulders disdainfully and said monsieur de marelle has no opinion on that subject the conversation grew slow madame de marelle seemed to offer provocation by her remarks while madame forestier's charming reserve the modesty in her voice in her smile all seemed to extenuate the bold sallies which issued from her lips the dessert came and then followed the coffee the hostess and her guests lighted cigarettes but forestier suddenly began to cough when the attack was over he growled angrily <coughs> these parties are not good for me they are stupid let us go home madame de marelle summoned the waiter and asked for her bill she tried to read it but the figures danced before her eyes she handed the paper to duroy here pay it for me i cannot see at the same time she put her purse in his hand the total was one hundred and thirty francs duroy glanced at the bill and when it was settled whispered how much shall i give the waiter whatever you like i do not know he laid five francs upon the plate and handed the purse to its owner saying shall i escort you home certainly i am unable to find the house 
they shook hands with the forestiers and were soon rolling along in a cab side by side duroy could think of nothing to say he felt impelled to clasp her in his arms if i should dare what would she do thought he the recollection of their conversation at dinner emboldened but the fear of scandal restrained him madame de marelle reclined silently in her corner he would have thought her asleep had he not seen her eyes glisten whenever a ray of light penetrated the dark recesses of the carriage of what was she thinking suddenly she moved her foot nervously impatiently that movement caused him to tremble and turning quickly he cast himself upon her seeking her lips with his she uttered a cry attempted to repulse him and then yielded to his caresses as if she had not the strength to resist the carriage stopped at her door but she did not rise she did not move stunned by what had just taken place fearing that the cabman would mistrust something duroy alighted from the cab first and offered his hand to the young woman finally she got out but in silence georges rang the bell and when the door was opened he asked timidly when shall i see you again she whispered so low that he could barely hear her come and lunch with me to-morrow with those words she disappeared duroy gave the cabman a five-franc piece and turned away with a triumphant joyful air he had at last conquered a married woman a woman of the world a parisian how easy it had been end of chapter 5 part 1 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Chapter Five, Part Two, of Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel, by Guy de Maupassant, translator unknown. Chapter Five the first intrigue part two he was somewhat nervous the following day as he ascended madame de marelle's staircase how would she receive him suppose she forbade him to enter her house if she had told but no she could not tell anything without telling the whole truth he was master of the situation the little maid-servant opened the door she was as pleasant as usual duroy felt reassured and asked is madame well yes sir as well as she always is was the reply and he was ushered into the salon he walked to the mantelpiece to see what kind of an appearance he presented he was readjusting his cravat when he saw in the mirror the young woman standing on the threshold looking at him he pretended not to have seen her and for several moments they gazed at one another in the mirror then he turned she had not moved she seemed to be waiting he rushed towards her crying how i love you he clasped her to his breast he thought it is easier than i thought it would be 
all is well he looked at her with a smile without uttering a word trying to put into his glance a wealth of love she too smiled and murmured we are alone i sent lorine to lunch with a friend he sighed and kissing her wrist said thanks i adore you she took his arm as if he had been her husband and led him to a couch upon which they seated themselves side by side duroy stammered incoherently you do not care for me she laid her hand upon his lips be silent how i love you said he she repeated be silent they could hear the servant laying the table in the dining-room he rose i cannot sit so near you i shall lose my head the door opened madame is served he offered her his arm gravely they lunched without knowing what they were eating the servant came and went without seeming to notice anything when the meal was finished they returned to the drawing-room and resumed their seats on the couch side by side gradually he drew nearer her and tried to embrace her be careful someone might come in he whispered when can i see you alone to tell you how i love you she leaned towards him and said softly i will pay you a visit one of these days he coloured my rooms are, are very modest she smiled that makes no difference i shall come to see you and not your rooms he urged her to tell him when she would come she fixed a day in the following week while he besought her with glowing eyes to hasten the day she was amused to see him implore so ardently and yielded a day at a time he repeated to-morrow say to-morrow finally she consented yes to-morrow at five o'clock he drew a deep breath then they chatted together as calmly as if they had known one another for twenty years a ring caused them to start they separated she murmured it is lorine the child entered paused in surprise then ran towards du roi clapping her hands delighted to see him and crying ah bel ami madame de marel laughed bel ami lorraine has christened you it is a pretty name i shall call you bel ami too he took the child upon his knee at twenty minutes of three he rose to go to the office at the half-open door he whispered to-morrow five o'clock the young woman replied yes with a smile and disappeared after he had finished his journalistic work he tried to render his apartments more fit to receive his expected visitor he was well satisfied with the results of his efforts and retired lulled to rest by the whistling of the trains early the next morning he bought a cake and a bottle of madeira he spread the collation on his dressing-table which was covered with a napkin then he waited she came at a quarter past five and exclaimed as she entered why it is nice here but there were a great many people on the stairs he took her in his arms and kissed her hair 
an hour and a half later he escorted her to a cab stand on the rue de rome when she was seated in the cab he whispered tuesday at the same hour she repeated his words and as it was night she kissed him then as the cabman started up his horse she cried adieu bel ami and the old coupe rumbled off for three weeks duroy received madame de marelle every two or three days sometimes in the morning sometimes in the evening as he was awaiting her one afternoon a noise on the staircase drew him to his door a child screamed a man's angry voice cried what is the brat howling about a woman's voice replied nicola has been tripped up on the landing place by the journalist's sweetheart duroy retreated for he heard the rustling of skirts soon there was a knock at his door which he opened and madame de marelle rushed in crying did you hear georges feigned ignorance of the matter no what how they insulted me who those miserable people below why no what is it tell me she sobbed and could not speak he was forced to place her upon his bed and to lay a damp cloth upon her temples when she grew calmer anger succeeded her agitation she wanted duroy to go downstairs at once to fight them to kill them he replied they are working people just think it would be necessary to go to court where you would be recognized one must not compromise oneself with such people she said what shall we do i cannot come here again he replied that is very simple i will move she murmured yes but that will take some time suddenly she said listen to me i have found a means do not worry about it i will send you a little blue to-morrow morning she called a telegram a little blue she smiled with delight at her plans which she would not reveal she was however very much affected as she descended the staircase and leaned with all her strength upon her lover's arm they met no one he was still in bed the following morning when the promised telegram was handed him duroy opened it and read come at five o'clock to rue de constantinople number one two seven ask for the room rented by madame duroy clou at five o'clock precisely he entered a large furnished house and asked the janitor has madame duroy hired a room here yes sir will you show it to me if you please the man accustomed no doubt to situations in which it was necessary to be prudent looked him straight in the eyes then selecting a key he asked are you monsieur duroy certainly he opened a small suite comprising two rooms on the ground floor duroy thought uneasily this will cost a fortune i shall have to run into debt she has done a very foolish thing the door opened and clotilde rushed in she was enchanted is it not fine there are no stairs to climb it is on the ground floor one could come and go through the window without the porter seeing one he embraced her nervously not daring to ask the question that hovered upon his lips 
she had placed a large package on the stand in the centre of the room opening it she took out a tablet of soap a bottle of lubin's extract a sponge a box of hairpins a button-hook and curling tongs then she amused herself by finding places in which to put them she talked incessantly as she opened the drawers i must bring some linen in order to have a change we shall each have a key besides the one at the lodge in case we should forget ours i rented the apartments for three months in your name of course for i could not give mine then he asked will you tell me when to pay she replied simply it is paid my dear he made a pretence of being angry i cannot permit that she laid her hand upon his shoulder and said in a supplicatory tone georges it will give me pleasure to have the nest mine say that you do not care dear georges and he yielded when she had left him he murmured she is kind-hearted anyway several days later he received a telegram which read my husband is coming home this evening we shall therefore not meet for a week what a bore my dearest your clou duroy was startled he had not realized the fact that madame de marelle was married he impatiently awaited her husband's departure one morning he received the following telegram five o'clock clou when they met she rushed into his arms kissed him passionately and asked after a while will you take me to dine certainly my darling wherever you wish to go i should like to go to some restaurant frequented by the working classes they repaired to a wine merchant's where meals were also served clotilde's entrance caused a sensation on account of the elegance of her dress they partook of a ragout of mutton and left that place to enter a ballroom in which she pressed more closely to his side in fifteen minutes her curiosity was satisfied and he conducted her home then followed a series of visits to all sorts of places of amusement duroy soon began to tire of these expeditions for he had exhausted all his resources and all means of obtaining money in addition to that he owed forestier a hundred francs jacques rival three hundred and he was hampered with innumerable petty debts ranging from twenty francs to one hundred sous end of chapter five part two Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter 5, Part 3 of Bellamy, or the History of a Scoundrel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Bellamy, or the History of a Scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter five the first intrigue part three on the fourteenth of december he was left without a sou in his pocket as he had often done before he did not lunch and spent the afternoon working at the office at four o'clock he received a telegram from madame de marelle saying 
shall we dine together and afterward have a frolic he replied at once impossible to dine then he added but i will expect you at our apartments at nine o'clock having sent a boy with the note in order to save the money for a telegram he tried to think of some way by which he could obtain his evening meal he waited until all of his associates had gone and when he was alone he rang for the porter put his hand in his pocket and said foucard i have left my purse at home and i have to dine at the luxembourg lend me fifty sous to pay for my cab the man handed him three francs and asked is that enough yes thank you taking the coins duroy rushed down the staircase and dined at a cook-shop at nine o'clock madame de marelle whom he awaited in the tiny salon arrived she wished to take a walk and he objected his opposition irritated her i shall go alone then adieu seeing that the situation was becoming grave he seized her hands and kissed them saying pardon me darling i am nervous and out of sorts this evening i have been annoyed by business matters somewhat appeased but still vexed she replied that does not concern me i will not be the butt for your ill humour he clasped her in his arms and murmured his apologies still she persisted in her desire to go out i beseech you remain here by the fire with me say yes no she replied i will not yield to your caprices he insisted i have a reason a serious reason if you will not go with me i shall go alone adieu she disengaged herself from his embrace and fled to the door he followed her listen clo my little clo listen to me she shook her head evaded his caresses and tried to escape from his encircling arms i have a reason looking him in the face she said you lie what is it he coloured and in order to avoid a rupture confessed in accents of despair i have no money she would not believe him until he had turned all his pockets inside out to prove his words then she fell upon his breast oh my poor darling had i known how did it happen he invented a touching story to this effect that his father was in straitened circumstances that he had given him not only his savings but had run himself into debt i shall have to starve for the next six months shall i lend you some she whispered he replied with dignity you are very kind dearest but do not mention that again it wounds me she murmured you will never know how much i love you on taking leave of him she asked shall we meet again the day after to-morrow certainly at the same time yes my darling they parted when duroy opened his bedroom door and fumbled in his vest pocket for a match he was amazed to find in it a piece of money a twenty franc piece at first he wondered by what miracle it had got there suddenly it occurred to him that madame de marelle had given him arms 
angry and humiliated, he determined to return it when next they met. The next morning it was late when he awoke. He tried to overcome his hunger. He went out, and as he passed the restaurants, he could scarcely resist their temptations. At noon, he said, Bah! I shall lunch upon Clotilde's twenty francs. That will not hinder me from returning the money to-morrow. He ate his lunch, for which he paid two francs fifty, and on entering the office of La Vie Francaise, he repaid the porter the three francs he had borrowed from him. He worked until seven o'clock, then he dined, and he continued to draw upon the twenty francs until only four francs twenty remained. He decided to say to Madame de Marelle upon her arrival, I found the twenty franc piece you slipped into my pocket. I will not return the money to-day, but I will repay you when we next meet. When Madame came, he dared not broach the delicate subject. They spent the evening together, and appointed their next meeting for Wednesday of the following week, for Madame de Marelle had a number of engagements. Duroy continued to accept money from Clotilde, and quieted his conscience by assuring himself, I will give it back in a lump. It is nothing but borrowed money anyway. So he kept account of all that he received, in order to pay it back some day. One evening Madame de Marelle said to him, would you believe that I have never been to the Folie Bergère? Will you take me there? He hesitated, fearing a meeting with Rachel. Then he thought, Pah, I am not married after all. If she should see me, she would take in the situation and not accost me. Moreover, we would have a box. When they entered the hall it was crowded. With difficulty they made their way to the seats. Madame de Marelle did not look at the stage. She was interested in watching the women who were promenading, and she felt an irresistible desire to touch them, to see of what those beings were made. Suddenly she said, there is a large brunette who stares at us all the time. I think every minute she will speak to us. Have you seen her? He replied, No, you are mistaken. He told an untruth, for he had noticed the woman who was no other than Rachel, with anger in her eyes and violent words upon her lips. Du Roy had passed her when he and Madame de Marelle entered, and she had said to him, Good evening, in a low voice, and with a wink which said, I understand. But he had not replied. For fear of being seen by his sweetheart, he passed her coldly, disdainfully. The woman, her jealousy aroused, followed the couple and said in a louder key good evening georges he paid no heed to her then she was determined to be recognized and she remained near their box awaiting a favorable moment when she saw that she was observed by madame de marelle she touched duroy's shoulder with the tip of her finger and said good evening how are you but georges did not turn his head she continued have you grown deaf since thursday still he did not reply she laughed angrily and cried are you dumb too perhaps madame has your tongue 
with a furious glance du roi then exclaimed how dare you accost me go along or i will have you arrested with flaming eyes she cried ah is that so because you are with another is no reason that you cannot recognize me if you had made the least sign of recognition when you passed me i would not have molested you you did not even say good evening to me when you met me during that tirade madame de marelle in a fright opened the door of the box and fled through the crowd seeking an exit duroy rushed after her rachel seeing him disappear cried stop her she has stolen my lover two men seized the fugitive by the shoulder but duroy who had caught up with her bade them desist and together he and clotilde reached the street they entered a cab the cabman asked where shall i drive to duroy replied where you will clotilde sobbed hysterically duroy did not know what to say or do at length he stammered listen clo my dearest clo let me explain it is not my fault i knew that woman long ago she raised her head and with the fury of a betrayed woman she cried disconnectedly ah oh, you miserable fellow what a rascal you are is it possible what disgrace oh my god you gave her my money did you not i gave him the money but that woman oh the wretch for several moments she seemed to be vainly seeking an epithet more forcible suddenly leaning forward she grasped the cabman's sleeve stop she cried and opening the door she alighted georges was about to follow her but she commanded i forbid you to follow me in a voice so loud that the passers-by crowded around her and duroy dared not stir for fear of a scandal she drew out her purse and taking two francs fifty from it she handed it to the cabman saying aloud here is the money for your hour take that rascal to rue bourseau at batignolles the crowd applauded one man said bravo little one and the cab moved on followed by the jeers of the bystanders end of chapter five part three recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter six part one of bel ami or the history of a scoundrel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter six a step upward part one the next morning georges duroy arose dressed himself and determined to have money he sought forestier his friend received him in his study what made you rise so early he asked a very serious matter i have a debt of honour a gaming debt he hesitated then repeated a gaming debt is it large five hundred francs he only needed two hundred and eighty forestier asked sceptically 
to whom do you owe that amount duroy did not reply at once to to a monsieur de carleville ah where does he live rue rue forestier laughed i know the gentleman if you want twenty francs you can have them but no more duroy took the gold piece called upon more friends and by five o'clock had collected eighty francs as he required two hundred more he kept what he had begged and muttered i shall not worry about it i will pay it when i can for two weeks he lived economically but at the end of that time the good resolutions he had formed vanished and one evening he returned to the folie bergere in search of rachel but the woman was implacable and heaped coarse insults upon him until he felt his cheeks tingle and he left the hall forestier out of health and feeble made duroy's existence at the office insupportable the latter did not reply to his rude remarks but determined to be avenged he called upon madame forestier he found her reclining upon a couch reading she held out her hand without rising and said good morning bel ami why do you call me by that name she replied with a smile i saw madame de marelle last week and i know what they have christened you at her house he took a seat near his hostess and glanced at her curiously she was a charming blonde fair and plump made for caresses and he thought she is certainly nicer than the other one he did not doubt that he would only have to extend his hand in order to gather the fruit as he gazed upon her she chided him for his neglect of her he replied i did not come because it was for the best how why why can you not guess no because i loved you a little only a little and i did not wish to love you any more she did not seem surprised nor flattered she smiled indifferently and replied calmly oh you can come just the same no one loves me long why not because it is useless and i tell them so at once if you had confessed your fears to me sooner i would have reassured you my dear friend a man in love is not only foolish but dangerous i cease all intercourse with people who love me or pretend to firstly because they bore me and secondly because i look upon them with dread as i would upon a mad dog i know that your love is only a kind of appetite while with me it would be a communion of souls now look me in the face she no longer smiled i will never be your sweetheart it is therefore useless for you to persist in your efforts and now that i have explained shall we be friends he knew that that sentence was irrevocable and delighted to be able to form such an alliance as she proposed he extended both hands saying i am yours madame to do with as you will he kissed her hands and raising his head said if i had found a woman like you how gladly would i have married her 
she was touched by those words and in a soft voice placing her hand upon his arm she said i am going to begin my offices at once you are not diplomatic she hesitated may i speak freely yes call upon madame walter who has taken a fancy to you but be guarded as to your compliments for she is virtuous you will make a better impression there by being careful in your remarks i know that your position at the office is unsatisfactory but do not worry all their employees are treated alike he said thanks you are an angel a guardian angel as he took his leave he asked again are we friends is it settled it is having observed the effect of his last compliment he said if you ever become a widow i have put in my application then he left the room hastily in order not to allow her time to be angry duroy did not like to call on madame walter for he had never been invited and he did not wish to commit a breach of etiquette the manager had been kind to him appreciated his services employed him to do difficult work why should he not profit by that show of favour to call at his house one day therefore he repaired to the market and bought twenty-five pears having carefully arranged them in a basket to make them appear as if they came from a distance he took them to madame walter's door with his card on which was inscribed georges duroy begs madame walter to accept the fruit which he received this morning from normandy the following day he found in his letter-box at the office an envelope containing madame walter's card on which was written madame walter thanks monsieur georges duroy very much and is at home on saturdays the next saturday he called monsieur walter lived on boulevard malesherbes in a double house which he owned the reception rooms were on the first floor in the antechamber were two footmen one took duroy's overcoat the other his cane put it aside opened a door and announced the visitor's name in the large mirror in the apartment duroy could see the reflection of people seated in another room he passed through two drawing-rooms and entered a small boudoir in which four ladies were gathered around a tea-table notwithstanding the assurance he had gained during his life in paris and especially since he had been thrown into contact with so many noted personages duroy felt abashed he stammered madame i took the liberty the mistress of the house extended her hand and said to him you are very kind monsieur duroy to come to see me she pointed to a chair the ladies chatted on visitors came and went madame walter noticed that duroy said nothing that no one addressed him that he seemed disconcerted and she drew him into the conversation which dealt with the admission of a certain monsieur linet to the academy when duroy had taken his leave one of the ladies said how odd he is who is he madame walter replied one of our reporters he only occupies a minor position but i think he will advance rapidly 
in the meantime while he was being discussed duroy walked gaily down boulevard malesherbe the following week he was appointed editor of the echoes and invited to dine at madame walter's the echoes were m walter said the very pith of the paper everything and everybody should be remembered all countries all professions paris and the provinces the army the arts the clergy the schools the rulers and the courtiers the man at the head of the department should be wide awake always on his guard quick to judge of what was best to be said and best to be omitted to divine what would please the public and to present it well duroy was just the man for the place he was enjoying the fact of his promotion when he received an engraved card which read monsieur and madame walter request the pleasure of monsieur georges duroy's company at dinner on thursday january the twentieth he was so delighted that he kissed the invitation as if it had been a love letter then he sought the cashier to settle the important question of his salary at first twelve hundred francs were allowed duroy who intended to save a large share of the money he was busy two days getting settled in his new position in a large room one end of which he occupied and the other end of which was allotted to boisrenard who worked with him the day of the dinner party he left the office in good season in order to have time to dress and was walking along rue de londres when he saw before him a form which resembled madame de marelle's he felt his cheeks glow and his heart throb he crossed the street in order to see the lady's face he was mistaken and breathed more freely he had often wondered what he should do if he met clotilde face to face should he bow to her or pretend not to see her i should not see her thought he when duroy entered his rooms he thought i must change my apartments these will not do any longer he felt both nervous and gay and said aloud to himself i must write to my father occasionally he wrote home and his letters always delighted his old parents as he tied his cravat at the mirror he repeated i must write home to-morrow if my father could see me this evening in the house to which i am going he would be surprised sacristi i shall soon give a dinner which has never been equalled then he recalled his old home the faces of his father and mother he saw them seated at their homely board eating their soup he remembered every wrinkle on their old faces every movement of their hands and heads he even knew what they said to each other every evening as they supped he thought i will go to see them some day his toilette completed he extinguished his light and descended the stairs end of chapter 6 part 1 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter 6 part 2 of bellamy or the history of a scoundrel this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Martin Giessen. Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel, by Guy de Maupassant. Translator unknown. Chapter Six. A Step Upward. Part Two. On reaching his destination, he boldly entered the antechamber, lighted by bronze lamps, and gave his cane and his overcoat to the two lackeys who approached him. All the salons were lighted. Madame Walter received in the second, the largest. She greeted Duroy with a charming smile and he shook hands with the two men who arrived after him monsieur firmin and monsieur la roche mathieu the latter had especial authority at the office on account of his influence in the chamber of deputies then the forestiers arrived madeleine looking charming in pink charles had become very much emaciated and coughed incessantly norbert de varenne and jacques rival came together a door opened at the end of the room and m walter entered with two tall young girls of sixteen and seventeen one plain the other pretty duroy knew that the manager was a paterfamilias but he was astonished he had thought of the manager's daughters as one thinks of a distant country one will never see then too he had fancied them children and he saw women they shook hands upon being introduced and seated themselves at a table set apart for them one of the guests had not arrived and that embarrassing silence which precedes dinners in general reigned supreme duroy happening to glance at the walls m walter said you are looking at my pictures i will show them all to you and he took a lamp that they might distinguish all the details there were landscapes by guillemet a visit to the hospital by gervex a widow by bouguereau an execution by jean paul laurent and many others duroy exclaimed charming charming char but stopped short on hearing behind him the voice of madame de marelle who had just entered m walter continued to exhibit and explain his pictures but duroy saw nothing heard without comprehending madame de marelle was there behind him what should he do if he greeted her might she not turn her back upon him or utter some insulting remark if he did not approach her what would people think he was so ill at ease that at one time he thought he should feign indisposition and return home the pictures had all been exhibited m walter placed the lamp on the table and greeted the last arrival while duroy recommenced alone an examination of the canvas as if he could not tear himself away what should he do he heard their voices and their conversation madame forestier called him he hastened towards her it was to introduce him to a friend who was on the point of giving a fete and who wanted a description of it in la vie francaise he stammered certainly madame certainly madame de marelle was very near him he dared not turn to go away suddenly to his amazement she exclaimed 
good evening bel ami do you not remember me he turned upon his heel hastily she stood before him smiling her eyes overflowing with roguishness and affection she offered him her hand he took it doubtfully fearing some perfidy she continued calmly what has become of you one never sees you not having regained his self-possession he murmured i have had a great deal to do madame a great deal to do m walter has given me another position and the duties are very arduous i know but that is no excuse for forgetting your friends their conversation was interrupted by the entrance of a large woman decolleté with red arms red cheeks and attired in gay colours as she was received with effusion duroy asked madame forestier who is that person viscountess de persemur whose nom de plume is patte blanche he was surprised and with difficulty restrained a burst of laughter patte blanche i fancied her a young woman like you is that patte blanche ah she is handsome very handsome a servant appeared at the door and announced madame is served duroy was placed between the manager's plain daughter mademoiselle rose and madame de marelle the proximity of the latter embarrassed him somewhat although she appeared at ease and, and conversed with her usual spirit gradually however his assurance returned and before the meal was over he knew that their relations would be renewed wishing too to be polite to his employer's daughter he addressed her from time to time she responded as her mother would have done without any hesitation as to what she should say at m walter's right sat viscountess de persemur and duroy looking at her with a smile asked madame de marelle in a low voice do you know the one who signs herself domino rose yes perfectly baroness de livar is she like the countess no but she is just as comical she is sixty years old has false curls and teeth wit of the time of the restoration and toilette of the same period when the guests returned to the drawing-room duroy asked madame de marelle may i escort you home no why not because m laroche mathieu who is my neighbour leaves me at my door every time that i dine here when shall i see you again lunch with me to-morrow they parted without another word duroy did not remain late as he descended the staircase he met norbert de varenne who was likewise going away the old poet took his arm fearing no rivalry on the newspaper their work being essentially different he was very friendly to the young man shall we walk along together i shall be pleased to replied duroy the streets were almost deserted that night at first the two men did not speak then duroy in order to make some remark said that m laroche mathieu looks very intelligent the old poet murmured do you think so the younger man hesitated in surprise why yes is he not considered one of the most capable men in the chamber 
that may be in a kingdom of blind men the blind are kings all those people are divided between money and politics they are pedants to whom it is impossible to speak of anything that is familiar to us ah it is difficult to find a man who is liberal in his ideas i have known several they are dead still what difference does a little more or a little less genius make since all must come to an end he paused and duroy said with a smile you are gloomy to-night sir the poet replied i always am my child you will be two in a few years while one is climbing the ladder one sees the top and feels hopeful but when one has reached that summit one sees the descent and the end which is death it is slow work ascending but one descends rapidly at your age one is joyous one hopes for many things which never come to pass at mine one expects nothing but death duroy laughed egad you make me shudder norbert de varenne continued you do not understand me now but later on you will remember what i have told you we breathe sleep drink eat work and then die the end of life is death what do you long for love a few kisses and you will be powerless money what for to gratify your desires glory what comes after it all death death alone is certain he stopped took duroy by his coat collar and said slowly ponder upon all that young man think it over for days months and years and you will see life from a different standpoint i am a lonely old man i have neither father mother brother sister wife children nor god i have only poetry marry my friend you do not know what it is to live alone at my age it is so lonesome i seem to have no one upon earth when one is old it is a comfort to have children when they reached rue de bourgogne the poet halted before a high house rang the bell pressed duroy's hand and said forget what i have said to you young man and live according to your age adieu with those words he disappeared in the dark corridor duroy felt somewhat depressed on leaving varenne but on his way a perfumed damsel passed by him and recalled to his mind his reconciliation with madame de marelle how delightful was the realization of one's hopes the next morning he arrived at his lady-love's door somewhat early she welcomed him as if there had been no rupture and said as she kissed him you do not know how annoyed i am my beloved i anticipated a delightful honeymoon and now my husband has come home for six weeks but i could not let so long a time go by without seeing you especially after our little disagreement and this is how i have arranged matters come to dinner monday i will introduce you to monsieur de marelle i have already spoken of you to him duroy hesitated in perplexity 
he feared he might betray something by a word a glance he stammered no i would rather not meet your husband why not how absurd such things happen every day i did not think you so foolish very well i will come to dinner monday to make it more pleasant i will have the forestier though i do not like to receive company at home on monday as he ascended madame de marelle's staircase he felt strangely troubled not that he disliked to take her husband's hand drink his wine and eat his bread but he dreaded something he knew not what he was ushered into the salon and he waited as usual then the door opened and a tall man with a white beard grave and precise advanced towards him and said courteously my wife has often spoken of you sir i am charmed to make your acquaintance duroy tried to appear cordial and shook his host's proffered hand with exaggerated energy m de marel put a log upon the fire and asked have you been engaged in journalism a long time duroy replied only a few months his embarrassment wearing off he began to consider the situation very amusing he gazed at m de marel serious and dignified and felt a desire to laugh aloud at that moment madame de marel entered and approached duroy who in the presence of her husband dared not kiss her hand laurine entered next and offered her brow to georges her mother said to her you do not call m duroy bel ami to-day the child blushed as if it were a gross indiscretion to reveal her secret when the forestiers arrived duroy was startled at charles's appearance he had grown thinner and paler in a week and coughed incessantly he said they would leave for cannes on the following thursday at the doctor's orders they did not stay late after they had left duroy said with a shake of his head he will not live long madame de marel replied calmly no he is doomed he was a lucky man to obtain such a wife duroy asked does she help him very much she does all the work she is well posted on every subject and she always gains her point as she wants it and when she wants it oh she is as manoeuvring as any one she is a treasure to a man who wishes to succeed georges replied she will marry very soon again i have no doubt yes i should not even be surprised if she had some one in view a deputy but i do not know anything about it m de marel said impatiently you infer so many things that i do not like we should never interfere in the affairs of others every one should make that a rule duroy took his leave with a heavy heart the next day he called on the forestier and found them in the midst of packing charles lay upon a sofa and repeated <coughs> i should have gone a month ago then he proceeded to give duroy innumerable orders although everything had been arranged with m walter when georges left him he pressed his comrade's hand and said well old fellow we shall soon meet again 
madame forestier accompanied him to the door and he reminded her of their compact we are friends and allies are we not if you should require my services in any way do not hesitate to call upon me send me a dispatch or a letter and i will obey she murmured thank you i shall not forget as duroy descended the staircase he met m de vaudrec ascending the count seemed sad perhaps at the approaching departure the journalist bowed the count returned his salutation courteously but somewhat haughtily on thursday evening the forestiers left town End of chapter 6, part 2 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 7 of Belle Amie, or the History of a Scoundrel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen Belle Amie, or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter seven a duel with an end charles's absence gave du roi a more important position on la vie francaise only one matter arose to annoy him otherwise his sky was cloudless an insignificant paper la plume attacked him constantly or rather attacked the editor of the echoes of la vie francaise jacques rival said to him one day you are very forbearing what should i do it is no direct attack but one afternoon when he entered the office Warrenard handed him a number of la plume see here is another unpleasant remark for you relative to what to the arrest of one dame aubert georges took the paper and read a scathing personal denunciation duroy it seems had written an item claiming that dame aubert who as the editor of la plume claimed had been put under arrest was a myth the latter retaliated by accusing duroy of receiving bribes and of suppressing matter that should be published as saint potin entered duroy asked him have you seen the paragraph in la plume yes and i have just come from dame aubert's she is no myth but she has not been arrested that report has no foundation duroy went at once to m walter's office after hearing the case the manager bade him go to the woman's house himself find out the details and reply to the article duroy set out upon his errand and on his return to the office wrote the following an anonymous writer in la plume is trying to pick a quarrel with me on the subject of an old woman who he claims was arrested for disorderly conduct which i deny i have myself seen dame aubert who is sixty years old at least she told me the particulars of her dispute with a butcher as to the weight of some cutlets which dispute necessitated an explanation before a magistrate that is the whole truth in a nutshell as for the other insinuations i scorn them one never should reply to such things moreover when they are written under a mask georges du roi m walter and jacques rival considered that sufficient 
and it was decided that it should be published in that day's issue. Duroy returned home rather agitated and uneasy. What would this opponent reply? Who was he? Why that attack? He passed a restless night. When he re-read his article in the paper the next morning, he thought it more aggressive in print than it was in writing. He might, it seemed to him, have softened certain terms. He was excited all day and feverish during the night. He rose early to obtain an issue of La Plume, which should contain the reply to his note. He ran his eyes over the columns and at first saw nothing. He was beginning to breathe more freely when these words met his eye. Monsieur du Roy of la vie française gives us the lie. In doing so, he lies. He owns, however, that a woman named Aubert exists, and that she was taken before a magistrate by an agent. Two words only remain to be added to the word agent, which are of morals, and all is told. But the consciences of certain journalists are on a par with their talents. I sign myself Louis Langremont. Georges's heart throbbed violently, and he returned home in order to dress himself. He had been insulted, and in such a manner that it was impossible to hesitate. Why had he been insulted? For nothing, on account of an old woman who had quarrelled with her butcher. He dressed hastily and repaired to M. Walter's house, although it was scarcely eight o'clock. M. Walter was reading La Plume. Well, he said gravely on perceiving Du Roy, you cannot let that pass. The young man did not reply. The manager continued go at once in search of rival who will look after your interests du roy stammered several vague words and set out for rival's house jacques was still in bed but he rose when the bell rang and having read the insulting paragraph said whom would you like to have besides me i do not know Boisrenard? Yes. Are you a good swordsman? No. A good shot? I have used a pistol a good deal. Good. Come and exercise while I attend to everything. Wait a moment. He entered his dressing room and soon reappeared, washed, shaven, and presentable. Come with me, said he. He lived on the ground floor, and he led Du Roy into a cellar converted into a room for the practice of fencing and shooting. He produced a pair of pistols, and began to give his orders as briefly as if they were on the duelling ground. He was well satisfied with Du Roy's use of the weapons, and told him to remain there and practice until noon when he would return to take him to lunch and tell him the result of his mission. Left to his own devices, Du Roy aimed at the target several times, and then sat down to reflect. Such affairs were abominable anyway. What would a respectable man gain by risking his life? and he recalled Norbert de Varenne's remarks made to him a short while before. He was right, he declared aloud. It was gloomy in that cellar, as gloomy as in a tomb. What o'clock was it? The time dragged slowly on. 
suddenly he heard footsteps voices and jacques rival reappeared accompanied by boisrenard the former cried on perceiving du roi all is settled du roi thought the matter had terminated with a letter of apology his heart gave a bound and he stammered ah thank you rival continued Monsieur Langremont has accepted every condition. Twenty-five paces. Fire when the pistol is levelled and the order given. Then he added, Now let us lunch. It is past twelve o'clock. They repaired to a neighbouring restaurant. Duroy was silent. He ate that they might not think he was frightened and went in the afternoon with boisrenard to the office where he worked in an absent mechanical manner before leaving jacques rival shook hands with him and warned him that he and boisrenard would call for him in a carriage the next morning at seven o'clock to repair to the wood at vesinet where the meeting was to take place all had been settled without his saying a word giving his opinion accepting or refusing with such rapidity that his brain whirled and he scarcely knew what was taking place he returned home about nine o'clock in the evening after having dined with boisrenard who had not left him all day when he was alone he paced the floor he was too confused to think one thought alone filled his mind and that was a duel to-morrow he sat down and began to meditate he had thrown upon his table his adversary's card brought him by rival he read it for the twentieth time that day louis langremont one seven six rue montmartre nothing more who was the man how old was he how tall how did he look how odious that a total stranger should without rhyme or reason out of pure caprice annoy him thus on account of an old woman's quarrel with her butcher he said aloud the brute and glared angrily at the card he began to feel nervous the sound of his voice made him start he drank a glass of water and laid down he turned from his right side to his left uneasily he was thirsty he rose he felt restless am i afraid he asked himself why did his heart palpitate so wildly at the slightest sound he began to reason philosophically on the possibility of being afraid no certainly he was not since he was ready to fight still he felt so deeply moved that he wondered if one could be afraid in spite of oneself what would happen if that state of things should exist if he should tremble or lose his presence of mind he lighted his candle and looked in the glass he scarcely recognized his own face it was so changed suddenly he thought to-morrow at this time i may be dead he turned to his couch and saw himself stretched lifeless upon it he hastened to the window and opened it but the night air was so chilly that he closed it lighted a fire and began to pace the floor once more saying mechanically i must be more composed i will write to my parents in case of accident he took a sheet of paper and after several attempts began 
my dear father and mother at daybreak i am going to fight a duel and as something might happen he could write no more he rose with a shudder it seemed to him that notwithstanding his efforts he would not have the strength necessary to face the meeting he wondered if his adversary had ever fought before if he were known he had never heard his name however if he had not been a remarkable shot he would not have accepted that dangerous weapon without hesitation he ground his teeth to prevent his crying aloud suddenly he remembered that he had a bottle of brandy he fetched it from the cupboard and soon emptied it now he felt his blood course more warmly through his veins i have found a means said he day broke he began to dress when his heart failed him he took more brandy at length there was a knock at the door his friends had come they were wrapped in furs after shaking hands rival said it is as cold as siberia is all well yes are you calm very calm have you eaten and drunk something i do not need anything they descended the stairs a gentleman was seated in the carriage rival said dr le brumont duroy shook hands with him and stammered thank you as he entered the carriage jacques rival and boisrenard followed him and the coachman drove off he knew where to go the conversation flagged although the doctor related a number of anecdotes rival alone replied to him duroy tried to appear self-possessed but he was haunted continually by the fear of showing his feelings or of losing his self-possession rival addressed him saying i took the pistols to gastine renette he loaded them the box is sealed duroy replied mechanically thank you then rival proceeded to give him minute directions that he might make no mistakes duroy repeated those directions as children learn their lessons in order to impress them upon his memory as he muttered the phrases over and over he almost prayed that some accident might happen to the carriage if he could only break his leg at the end of a glade he saw a carriage standing and four gentlemen stamping their feet in order to keep them warm and he was obliged to gasp in order to get breath rival and boisrenard alighted first then the doctor and the combatant rival took the box of pistols and with boisrenard approached the two strangers who were advancing towards them duroy saw them greet one another ceremoniously then walk through the glade together as they counted the paces dr le primont asked duroy do you feel well do you not want anything nothing thank you it seemed to him that he was asleep that he was dreaming was he afraid he did not know jacques rival returned and said in a low voice all is ready fortune has favoured us in the drawing of the pistols that was a matter of indifference to duroy they helped him off with his overcoat led him to the ground set apart for the duel and gave him his pistol before him stood a man short stout and bald who wore glasses 
that was his adversary a voice broke the silence a voice which came from afar are you ready sirs georges cried yes the same voice commanded fire duroy heard nothing more saw nothing more he only knew that he raised his arm and pressed with all his strength upon the trigger soon he saw a little smoke before him his opponent was still standing in the same position and there was a small white cloud above his head they had both fired all was over his second and the doctor felt him unbuttoned his garments and asked anxiously are you wounded he replied no i think not Langremont was not wounded either and jacques rival muttered discontentedly that is always the way with those cursed pistols one either misses or kills one's opponent duroy was paralyzed with surprise and joy all was over he felt that he could fight the entire universe all was over what bliss he felt brave enough to provoke any one the seconds consulted several moments then the duelists and their friends entered the carriages and drove off when the official report was drawn up it was handed to duroy who was to insert it in the echoes he was surprised to find that two balls had been fired he said to rival we only fired once the latter smiled yes once once each that makes twice and duroy satisfied with that explanation asked no more questions m walter embraced him bravo you have defended the colours of la vie francaise bravo the following day at eleven o'clock in the forenoon duroy received a telegram my god i have been frightened come at once to rue de constantinople that i may embrace you my love how brave you are i adore you Clou. he repaired to the place appointed and madame de marelle rushed into his arms covering him with kisses oh my darling if you only knew how i felt when i read the morning papers tell me tell me all about it duroy was obliged to give her a detailed account you must have had a terrible night before the duel why no i slept very well i should not have closed my eyes tell me what took place on the ground forthwith he proceeded to give her a graphic description of the duel when he had concluded she said to him i cannot live without you i must see you and with my husband in paris it is not very convenient i often have an hour early in the morning when i could come and embrace you but i cannot enter that horrible house of yours what can we do he asked abruptly how much do you pay here one hundred francs a month very well i will take the apartments on my own account and i will move at once mine are not suitable anyway for me now she thought a moment and then replied no i do not want you to he asked in surprise why not because that is no reason these rooms suit me very well i am here i shall remain he laughed moreover they were hired in my name 
but she persisted no no i do not wish you to why not then she whispered softly tenderly because you would bring others here and i do not wish you to indignantly he cried never i promise you you would do so in spite of your promise i swear i will not truly truly upon my word of honour this is our nest ours alone she embraced him in a transport of delight then i agree my dearest but if you deceive me once just once that will end all between us for ever he protested and it was agreed that he should settle in the rooms that same day she said to him you must dine with us sunday my husband thinks you charming he was flattered indeed yes you have made a conquest did you not tell me that your home was in the country yes why then you know something about agriculture yes very well talk to him of gardening and crops he enjoys those subjects all right i shall not forget she left him after lavishing upon him innumerable caresses End of chapter seven recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter eight of bel ami or the history of a scoundrel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter eight death and a proposal duroy moved his effects to the apartments in rue de constantinople two or three times a week madame de marelle paid him visits duroy to counterbalance them dined at her house every thursday and delighted her husband by talking agriculture to him it was almost the end of february duroy was free from care one night when he returned home he found a letter under his door he examined the postmark it was from cannes having opened it he read cannes villa jolie dear sir and friend you told me did you not that i could count upon you at any time very well i have a favour to ask of you it is to come and help me not to leave me alone during charles's last moments he may not live through the week although he is not confined to his bed but the doctor has warned me i have not the strength nor the courage to see that agony day and night and i think with terror of the approaching end i can only ask such a thing of you for my husband has no relatives you were his comrade he helped you to your position come i beg of you i have no one else to ask your friend madeleine forestier georges murmured certainly i will go poor charles the manager to whom he communicated the contents of that letter grumblingly gave his consent he repeated but return speedily you are indispensable to us georges du roy left for cannes the next day by the seven o'clock express after having warned madame de marel by telegram he arrived the following day at four o'clock in the afternoon 
a commissionaire conducted him to villa jolie the house was small and low and of the italian style of architecture a servant opened the door and cried oh sir madame is awaiting you patiently duroy asked how is your master not very well sir he will not be here long the floor of the drawing-room which the young man entered was covered with a persian rug the large windows looked upon the village and the sea duroy murmured how cosy it is here where the deuce do they get the money from the rustling of a gown caused him to turn madame forestier extended both her hands saying how kind of you to come she was a trifle paler and thinner but still as bright as ever and perhaps prettier for being more delicate she whispered it is terrible he knows he cannot be saved and he tyrannizes over me i have told him of your arrival but where is your trunk duroy replied i left it at the station not knowing which hotel you would advise me to stop at in order to be near you she hesitated then said you must stop here at the villa your chamber is ready he might die at any moment and if it should come in the night i would be alone i will send for your luggage he bowed as you will now let us go upstairs said she he followed her she opened a door on the first floor and duroy saw a form near a window seated in an easy chair and wrapped in coverlets he divined that it was his friend though he scarcely recognized him forestier raised his hand slowly and with difficulty saying you are here you have come to see me die i am much obliged duroy forced a smile to see you die that would not be a very pleasant sight and i would not choose that occasion on which to visit cannes i came here to rest sit down said forestier and he bowed his head as if deep in hopeless meditation seeing that he did not speak his wife approached the window and pointing to the horizon said look at that is it not beautiful in spite of himself duroy felt the grandeur of the closing day and exclaimed yes indeed it is magnificent forestier raised his head and said to his wife give me more air she replied you must be careful it is late the sun is setting you will catch more cold and that would be a serious thing in your condition he made a feeble gesture of anger with his right hand and said i tell you i am suffocating what difference does it make if i die a day sooner or later since i must die she opened the window wide the air was soft and balmy forestier inhaled it in feverish gasps he grasped the arms of his chair and said in a low voice shut the window i would rather die in a cellar his wife slowly closed the window then leaned her brow against the pane and looked out duroy ill at ease wished to converse with the invalid to reassure him but he could think of no words of comfort he stammered have you not been better since you are here his friend shrugged his shoulders impatiently you will see very soon 
and he bowed his head again duroy continued at home it is still wintry it snows hails rains and is so dark that they have to light the lamps at three o'clock in the afternoon forestier asked is there anything new at the office nothing they have taken little lacrin of the voltaire to fill your place but he is incapable it is time you came back the invalid muttered i i will soon be writing under six feet of sod a long silence ensued madame forestier did not stir she stood with her back to the room her face toward the window at length forestier broke the silence in a gasping voice heart-rending to listen to how many more sunsets shall i see eight ten fifteen twenty or perhaps thirty no more you will have more time you two as for me all is at an end and everything will go on when i am gone as if i were here he paused a few moments then continued everything that i see reminds me that i shall not see them long it is horrible i shall no longer see the smallest objects the glasses the dishes the beds on which we rest the carriages it is fine to drive in the evening how i loved all that again norbert de varenne's words occurred to duroy the room grew dark forestier asked irritably are we to have no lamp to-night that is what is called caring for an invalid the form outlined against the window disappeared and an electric bell was heard to ring a servant soon entered and placed a lamp upon the mantelpiece madame forestier asked her husband do you wish to retire or will you go downstairs to dinner i will go down to dinner the meal seemed to duroy interminable for there was no conversation only the ticking of a clock broke the silence when they had finished duroy pleading fatigue retired to his room and tried in vain to invent some pretext for returning home as quickly as possible he consoled himself by saying perhaps it will not be for long the next morning georges rose early and strolled down to the beach when he returned the servant said to him monsieur has asked for you two or three times will you go upstairs he ascended the stairs forestier appeared to be in a chair his wife reclining upon a couch was reading the invalid raised his head duroy asked well how are you you look better this morning forestier murmured yes i am better and stronger lunch as hastily as you can with madeleine because we are going to take a drive when madame forestier was alone with duroy she said to him you see to-day he thinks he is better he is making plans for to-morrow we are now going to gulf juan to buy pottery for our rooms in paris he is determined to go but he cannot stand the jolting on the road the carriage arrived forestier descended the stairs step by step supported by his servant when he saw the closed landau he wanted it uncovered his wife opposed him it is sheer madness you will take cold 
he persisted no i am going to be better i know it they first drove along a shady road and then took the road by the sea forestier explained the different points of interest finally they arrived at a pavilion over which were these words gulf juan art pottery and the carriage drew up at the door forestier wanted to buy a vase to put on his bookcase as he could not leave the carriage they brought the pieces to him one by one it took him a long time to choose consulting his wife and duroy you know it is for my study from my easy chair i can see it constantly i prefer the ancient form the greek at length he made his choice i shall return to paris in a few days said he on their way home along the gulf a cool breeze suddenly sprang up and the invalid began to cough at first it was nothing only a slight attack but it grew worse and turned to a sort of hiccup a rattle forestier choked and every time he tried to breathe he coughed violently nothing quieted him he had to be carried from the landau to his room the heat of the bed did not stop the attack which lasted until midnight the first words the sick man uttered were to ask for a barber for he insisted on being shaved every morning he rose to be shaved but was obliged to go to bed at once and began to breathe so painfully that madame forestier in a fright woke duroy and asked him to fetch the doctor he returned almost immediately with dr gavin who prescribed for the sick man when the journalist asked him his opinion he said it is the final stage he will be dead to-morrow morning prepare that poor young wife and send for a priest i can do nothing more however i am entirely at your disposal duroy went to madame forestier he is going to die the doctor advises me to send for a priest what will you do she hesitated a moment and then said slowly i will go and tell him that the cure wishes to see him will you be kind enough to procure one who will require nothing but the confession and who will not make much fuss the young man brought with him a kind old priest who accommodated himself to circumstances when he had entered the death-chamber madame forestier went out and seated herself with duroy in an adjoining room that has upset him said she when i mentioned the priest to him his face assumed a scared expression he knew that the end was near i shall never forget his face at that moment they heard the priest saying to him why no you are not so low as that you are ill but not in danger the proof of that is that i came as a friend a neighbour they could not hear his reply the priest continued no i shall not administer the sacrament we will speak of that when you are better if you will only confess i ask no more i am a pastor i take advantage of every occasion to gather in my sheep a long silence followed then suddenly the priest said in the tone of one officiating at the altar the mercy of god is infinite repeat the confiteor my son 
perhaps you have forgotten it i will help you repeat with me confiteor deo omnipotenti beata marie semper virgini he paused from time to time to permit the dying man to catch up to him then he said now confess the sick man murmured something the priest repeated you have committed sins of what kind my son the young woman rose and said simply let us go into the garden we must not listen to his secrets they seated themselves upon a bench before the door beneath a blossoming rose bush after several moments of silence duroy asked will it be some time before you return to paris no she replied when all is over i will go back in about ten days yes at most he continued charles has no relatives then none save cousins his father and mother died when he was very young in the course of a few minutes the servant came to tell them that the priest had finished and together they ascended the stairs forestier seemed to have grown thinner since the preceding day the priest was holding his hand au revoir my son i will come again to-morrow morning and he left when he was gone the dying man who was panting tried to raise his two hands towards his wife and gasped save me save me my darling i do not want to die oh save me go for the doctor i will take anything i do not want to die he wept the tears coursed down his pallid cheeks then his hands commenced to wander hither and thither continually slowly and regularly as if gathering something on the coverlet his wife who was also weeping sobbed no it is nothing it is only an attack you will be better to-morrow you you tired yourself out with that drive forestier drew his breath quickly and so faintly that one could scarcely hear him he repeated i do not want to die oh my god my god what has happened to me i cannot see oh my god his staring eyes saw something invisible to the others his hands plucked continually at the counterpane suddenly he shuddered and gasped <sighs> the cemetery me my god he did not speak again he lay there motionless and ghastly the hours dragged on the clock of a neighbouring convent chimed noon duroy left the room to obtain some food he returned an hour later madame forestier would eat nothing the invalid had not stirred the young woman was seated in an easy chair at the foot of the bed duroy likewise seated himself and they watched in silence a nurse sent by the doctor had arrived and was dozing by the window duroy himself was almost asleep when he felt a presentiment that something was about to happen he opened his eyes just in time to see forestier close his he coughed slightly and two streams of blood issued from the corners of his mouth and flowed upon his night-robe 
his hands ceased their perpetual motion he had breathed his last his wife perceiving it uttered a cry and fell upon her knees by the bedside georges in surprise and affright mechanically made the sign of the cross the nurse awakening approached the bed and said it has come duroy recovering his self-possession murmured with a sigh of relief it was not as hard as i feared it would be that night madame forestier and duroy watched in the chamber of death they were alone beside him who was no more they did not speak georges's eyes seemed attracted to that emaciated face which the flickering light made more hollow that was his friend charles forestier who the day before had spoken to him for several years he had lived eaten laughed loved and hoped as did every one and now all was ended for him for ever life lasted a few months or years and then fled one was born grew was happy and died adieu man or woman you will never return to earth he thought of the insects which live several hours of the beasts which live several days of the men who live several years of the worlds which last several centuries what was the difference between one and the other a few more dawns that was all duroy turned away his eyes in order not to see the corpse madame forestier's head was bowed her fair hair enhanced the beauty of her sorrowful face the young man's heart grew hopeful why should he lament when he had so many years still before him he glanced at the handsome widow how had she ever consented to marry that man then he pondered upon all the hidden secrets of their lives he remembered that he had been told of a count de vaudrec who had dowered and given her in marriage what would she do now whom would she marry had she projects plans he would have liked to know why that anxiety as to what she would do georges questioned himself and found that it was caused by a desire to win her for himself why should he not succeed he was positive that she liked him she would have confidence in him for she knew that he was intelligent resolute tenacious had she not sent for him was not that a kind of avowal he was impatient to question her to find out her intentions he would soon have to leave that villa for he could not remain alone with the young widow therefore he must find out her plans before returning to paris in order that she might not yield to another's entreaties he broke the oppressive silence by saying you must be fatigued yes but above all i am grieved their voices sounded strange in that room they glanced involuntarily at the corpse as if they expected to see it move duroy continued it is a heavy blow for you and will make a complete change in your life she sighed deeply but did not reply he added it is very sad for a young woman like you to be left alone he paused she still did not reply and he stammered 
at any rate you will remember the compact between us you can command me as you will i am yours she held out her hand to him and said mournfully and gently thanks you are very kind if i can do anything for you i say too count on me he took her proffered hand gazed at it and was seized with an ardent desire to kiss it slowly he raised it to his lips and then relinquished it as her delicate fingers lay upon her knee the young widow said gravely yes i shall be all alone but i shall force myself to be brave he did not know how to tell her that he would be delighted to wed her certainly it was no time to speak to her on such a subject however he thought he might be able to express himself by means of some phrase which would have a hidden meaning and would infer what he wished to say but that rigid corpse lay between them the atmosphere became oppressive almost suffocating duroy asked can we not open the window a little the air seems to be impure certainly she replied i have noticed it too he opened the window letting in the cool night air he turned come and look out it is delightful she glided softly to his side he whispered listen to me do not be angry that i broach the subject at such a time but the day after to-morrow i shall leave here and when you return to paris it might be too late you know that i am only a poor devil who has his position to make but i have the will and some intelligence and i am advancing a man who has attained his ambition knows what to count on a man who has his way to make does not know what may come it may be better or worse i told you one day that my most cherished dream was to have a wife like you i repeat it to you to-day do not reply but let me continue this is no proposal the time and place would render it odious i only wish to tell you that by a word you can make me happy and that you can make of me as you will either a friend or a husband for my heart and my body are yours i do not want you to answer me now i do not wish to speak any more on the subject here when we meet in paris you can tell me your decision he uttered those words without glancing at her and she seemed not to have heard them for she stood by his side motionless staring vaguely and fixedly at the landscape before her bathed in moonlight at length she murmured it is rather chilly and turned towards the bed duroy followed her they did not speak but continued their watch toward midnight georges fell asleep at daybreak the nurse entered and he started up both he and madame forestier retired to their rooms to obtain some rest at eleven o'clock they rose and lunched together while through the open window was wafted the sweet perfumed air of spring after lunch madame forestier proposed that they take a turn in the garden as they walked slowly along she suddenly said without turning her head toward him in a low grave voice listen to me my dear friend 
i have already reflected upon what you proposed to me and i cannot allow you to depart without a word of reply i will however say neither yes nor no we will wait we will see we will become better acquainted you must think it well over too do not yield to an impulse i mention this to you before even poor charles is buried because it is necessary after what you have said to me that you should know me as i am in order not to cherish the hope you expressed to me any longer if you are not a man who can understand and bear with me now listen carefully marriage to me is not a chain but an association i must be free entirely unfettered in all my actions my coming and my going i can tolerate neither control jealousy nor criticism as to my conduct i pledge my word however never to compromise the name of the man i marry nor to render him ridiculous in the eyes of the world but that man must promise to look upon me as an equal an ally and not as an inferior or as an obedient submissive wife my ideas i know are not like those of other people but i shall never change them do not answer me it would be useless we shall meet again and talk it all over later now take a walk i shall return to him good-bye until to-night he kissed her hand and left her without having uttered a word that night they met at dinner directly after the meal they sought their rooms worn out with fatigue charles forestier was buried the next day in the cemetery at cannes without any pomp and georges returned to paris by the express which left at one thirty madame forestier accompanied him to the station they walked up and down the platform awaiting the hour of departure and conversing on indifferent subjects the train arrived the journalist took his seat a porter cried marseille lyon paris all aboard the locomotive whistled and the train moved slowly out of the station the young man leaned out of the carriage and looked at the youthful widow standing on the platform gazing after him just as she was disappearing from his sight he threw her a kiss which she returned with a more discreet wave of her hand end of chapter 8 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter nine part one of bel ami or the history of a scoundrel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter nine marriage part one Georges Duroy resumed his old habits. Installed in the cosy apartments on Rue de Constantinople, his relations with Madame de Marelle became quite conjugal. Madame Forestier had not returned. She lingered at Cannes. He, however, received a letter from her, announcing her return about the middle of April but containing not a word as to their parting he waited 
he was resolved to employ every means to marry her if she seemed to hesitate he had faith in his good fortune in that power of attraction which he felt within him a power so irresistible that all women yielded to it at length a short note admonished him that the decisive moment had arrived i am in paris come to see me madeleine forestier nothing more he received it at nine o'clock at three o'clock of the same day he called at her house she extended both hands to him with a sweet smile and they gazed into each other's eyes for several seconds then she murmured how kind of you to come he replied i should have come whensoever you bade me they sat down she inquired about the walters his associates and the newspaper i miss that very much said she i had become a journalist in spirit i like the profession she paused he fancied he saw in her smile in her voice in her words a kind of invitation and although he had resolved not to hasten matters he stammered well why why do you not resume that profession under the name of du roi she became suddenly serious and placing her hand on his arm she said do not let us speak of that yet divining that she would accept him he fell upon his knees and passionately kissed her hands saying thank you thank you how i love you she rose she was very pale du roi kissed her brow when she had disengaged herself from his embrace she said gravely listen my friend i have not yet fully decided but my answer may be yes you must wait patiently however until i disclose the secret to you he promised and left her his heart overflowing with joy he worked steadily spent little tried to save some money that he might not be without a sou at the time of his marriage and became as miserly as he had once been prodigal summer glided by then autumn and no one suspected the tie existing between du roi and madame forestier for they seldom met in public one evening madeleine said to him you have not yet told madame de marelle our plans no my dear as you wished to keep them secret i have not mentioned them to a soul very well there is plenty of time i will tell the walters she turned away her head and continued if you wish we can be married the beginning of may i obey you in all things joyfully the tenth of may which falls on saturday would please me for it is my birthday very well the tenth of may your parents live near rouen do they not yes near rouen at canteleu i am very anxious to see them he hesitated perplexed but they are then he added more firmly my dear they are plain country people innkeepers who strained every nerve to give me an education i am not ashamed of them but their simplicity their rusticity might annoy you she smiled sweetly no i will love them very much we will visit them i wish to i too am the child of humble parents but i lost mine i have no one in the world she held out her hand to him 
but you he was affected conquered as he had never been by any woman i have been thinking of something said she but it is difficult to explain he asked what is it it is this i am like all women i have my my weaknesses i should like to bear a noble name can you not on the occasion of our marriage change your name somewhat she blushed as if she had proposed something indelicate he replied simply i have often thought of it but it does not seem easy to me <laughs> why not he laughed because i am afraid i should be ridiculed she shrugged her shoulders not at all not at all every one does it and no one laughs separate your name in this way du roi it sounds very well he replied no that will not do it is too common a proceeding i have thought of assuming the name of my native place first as a literary pseudonym and then as my surname in conjunction with du roi which might later on as you proposed be separated she asked is your native place canteleu yes i do not like the termination could we not modify it she took a pen and wrote down the names in order to study them suddenly she cried now i have it and held toward him a sheet of paper on which was written madame du roi de cantel gravely he replied yes it is very nice she was delighted and repeated du roi de cantel madame du roi de cantel it is excellent excellent then she added with an air of conviction you will see how easily it will be accepted by every one after to-morrow sign your articles d de cantel and your echoes simply du roi that is done on the press every day and no one will be surprised to see you take a nom de plume what is your father's name alexandre she murmured alexandre two or three times in succession then she wrote upon a blank sheet monsieur and madame alexandre du roi de cantel announce the marriage of their son monsieur georges du roi de cantel with madame forestier she examined her writing and charmed with the effect exclaimed with a little method one can succeed in anything when georges reached the street resolved to call himself henceforth du roi or even du roi de cantel it seemed to him that he was of more importance he swaggered more boldly held his head more erect and walked as he thought gentlemen should he felt a desire to inform the passers-by my name is du roi de cantel scarcely had he entered his apartments when the thought of madame de marelle rendered him uneasy and he wrote to her immediately appointing a meeting for the following day it will be hard thought he there will be a quarrel surely the next morning he received a telegram from madame informing him that she would be with him at one o'clock he awaited her impatiently determined to confess at once and afterward to argue with her to tell her that he could not remain a bachelor indefinitely and that as monsieur de marelle persisted in living he had been compelled to choose someone else as a legal companion 
when the bell rang his heart gave a bound madame de marelle entered and cast herself into his arms saying good afternoon bel ami perceiving that his embrace was colder than usual she glanced up at him and asked what ails you take a seat said he we must talk seriously she seated herself without removing her hat and waited he cast down his eyes he was preparing to commence finally he said slowly my dear friend you see that i am very much perplexed very sad and very much embarrassed by what i have to confess to you i love you i love you with all my heart and the fear of giving you pain grieves me more than what i have to tell you she turned pale trembled and asked what is it tell me quickly he said sadly but resolutely i am going to be married she sighed like one about to lose consciousness then she gasped but did not speak he continued you cannot imagine how much i suffered before taking that resolution but i have neither position nor money i am alone in paris i must have near me someone who can counsel comfort and support me what i need is an associate an ally and i have found one he paused hoping that she would reply expecting an outburst of furious rage reproaches and insults she pressed her hand to her heart and breathed with difficulty he took the hand resting on the arm of the chair but she drew it away and murmured as if stupefied oh my god he fell upon his knees before her without however venturing to touch her more moved by her silence than he would have been by her anger clo my little clo you understand my position oh if i could have married you what happiness it would have afforded me but you were married what could i do just think of it i must make my way in the world and i can never do so as long as i have no domestic ties if you knew there are days when i should like to kill your husband he spoke in a low seductive voice he saw two tears gather in madame de marelle's eyes and trickle slowly down her cheeks he whispered do not weep clo do not weep i beseech you you break my heart she made an effort to appear dignified and haughty and asked though somewhat unsteadily who is it for a moment he hesitated before he replied madeleine forestier madame de marelle started her tears continued to flow she rose duroy saw that she was going to leave him without a word of reproach or pardon and he felt humbled humiliated he seized her gown and implored do not leave me thus she looked at him with that despairing tearful glance so charming and so touching which expresses all the misery pent up in a woman's heart and stammered i have nothing to say i can do nothing you you are right you have made a good choice and disengaging herself she left the room with a sigh of relief at escaping so easily he repaired to madame forestier's who asked him 
have you told madame de marelle he replied calmly yes did it affect her not at all on the contrary she thought it an excellent plan the news was soon noised abroad some were surprised others pretended to have foreseen it and others again smiled inferring that they were not at all astonished the young man who signed his articles d de cantel his echoes du roi and his political sketches du roi spent the best part of his time with his betrothed who had decided that the day fixed for the wedding should be kept secret that the ceremony should be celebrated in the presence of witnesses only that they should leave the same evening for rouen and that the day following they should visit the journalist's aged parents and spend several days with them duroy had tried to persuade madeleine to abandon that project but not succeeding in his efforts he was finally compelled to submit end of chapter nine part one recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter nine part two of bel ami or the history of a scoundrel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter nine marriage part two the tenth of may arrived thinking a religious ceremony unnecessary as they had issued no invitations the couple were married at a magistrate's and took the six o'clock train for normandy as the train glided along duroy sitting in front of his wife took her hand kissed it and said when we return we will dine at chateau sometimes she murmured we shall have a great many things to do in a tone which seemed to say we must sacrifice pleasure to duty he retained her hand wondering anxiously how he could manage to caress her he pressed her hand slightly but she did not respond to the pressure he said it seems strange that you should be my wife she appeared surprised why i do not know it seems droll i want to embrace you and i am surprised that i have the right she calmly offered him her cheek which he kissed as he would have kissed his sisters he continued the first time i saw you you remember at that dinner to which i was invited at forestier's i thought sacristi if i could only find a wife like that and now i have one she glanced at him with smiling eyes he said to himself i am too cold i am stupid i should make more advances and he asked how did you make forestier's acquaintance she replied with provoking archness are we going to rouen to talk of him he coloured i am a fool you intimidate me she was delighted i impossible he seated himself beside her she exclaimed ah a stag the train was passing through the forest of st germain and she had seen a frightened deer clear an alley at a bound 
as she gazed out of the open window du roy bending over her pressed a kiss upon her neck for several moments she remained motionless then raising her head she said you tickle me stop but he did not obey her she repeated stop i say he seized her head with his right hand turned it toward him and pressed his lips to hers she struggled pushed him away and repeated stop he did not heed her with an effort she freed herself and rising said georges have done we are not children we shall soon reach rouen very well said he gaily i will wait reseating herself near him she talked of what they would do on their return they would keep the apartments in which she had lived with her first husband and du roy would receive forestier's position on la vie francaise in the meantime forgetting her injunctions and his promise he slipped his arm around her waist pressed her to him and murmured i love you dearly my little mad the gentleness of his tone moved the young woman and leaning toward him she offered him her lips as she did so a whistle announced the proximity of the station pushing back some stray locks upon her temples she exclaimed we are foolish he kissed her hands feverishly and replied i adore you my little mad on reaching rouen they repaired to a hotel where they spent the night the following morning when they had drunk the tea placed upon the table in their room du roy clasped his wife in his arms and said my little mad i feel that i love you very very much she smiled trustfully and murmured as she returned his kisses i love you too a little the visit to his parents worried georges although he had prepared his wife he began again you know they are peasants real not sham comic opera peasants she smiled i know it you have told me often enough we shall be very uncomfortable there is only a straw bed in my room they do not know what hair mattresses are at Canteleu. she seemed delighted so much the better it would be charming to sleep badly when near you and to be awakened by the crowing of the cocks he walked toward the window and lighted a cigarette the sight of the harbour of the river filled with ships moved him and he exclaimed egad but that is fine madeleine joined him and placing both of her hands on her husband's shoulder cried oh how beautiful i did not know that there were so many ships an hour later they departed in order to breakfast with the old couple who had been informed several days before of their intended arrival both du roy and his wife were charmed with the beauties of the landscape presented to their view and the cabman halted in order to allow them to get a better idea of the panorama before them as he whipped up his horse du roy saw an old couple not a hundred metres off approaching and he leaped from the carriage crying here they are i know them the man was short corpulent florid and vigorous notwithstanding his age the woman was tall thin and melancholy with stooping shoulders a woman who had worked from childhood who had never laughed nor jested 
madeleine too alighted and watched the couple advance with a contraction of her heart she had not anticipated they did not recognize their son in that fine gentleman and they would never have taken that handsome lady for their daughter-in-law they walked along past the child they were expecting without glancing at the city folks georges cried with a laugh good day father du roi both the old man and his wife were struck dumb with astonishment the latter recovered her self-possession first and asked is it you son the young man replied yes it is i mother du roi and approaching her he kissed her upon both cheeks and said this is my wife the two rustics stared at madeleine as if she were a curiosity with anxious fear combined with a sort of satisfied approbation on the part of the father and of jealous enmity on that of the mother m duroy senior who was naturally jocose made so bold as to ask with a twinkle in his eye may i kiss you too his son uttered an exclamation and madeleine offered her cheek to the old peasant who afterwards wiped his lips with the back of his hand the old woman in her turn kissed her daughter-in-law with hostile reserve her ideal was a stout rosy country lass as red as an apple and as round the carriage preceded them with the luggage the old man took his son's arm and asked him how are you getting on very well that is right tell me as your wife any means george replied forty thousand francs his father whistled softly and muttered Phew. then he added she is a handsome woman he admired his son's wife and in his day had considered himself a connoisseur madeleine and the mother walked side by side in silence the two men joined them they soon reached the village at the entrance to which stood m duroy's tavern a pine board fastened over the door indicated that thirsty people might enter the table was laid a neighbour who had come to assist made a low curtsey on seeing so beautiful a lady appear then recognising georges she cried oh lord is it you he replied merrily yes it is i mother brulin and he kissed her as he had kissed his father and mother then he turned to his wife come into our room said he you can lay aside your hat they passed through a door to the right and entered a room paved with brick with whitewashed walls and a bed with cotton hangings a crucifix above a holy water basin and two coloured prints representing paul and virginia beneath a blue palm tree and napoleon the first on a yellow horse were the only ornaments in that neat but bare room when they were alone georges embraced madeleine good morning mad i am glad to see the old people once more when one is in paris one does not think of this place but when one returns one enjoys it just the same at that moment his father cried knocking on the partition with his fist come the soup is ready they re-entered the large public room and took their seats at the table the meal was a long one served in a truly rustic fashion father du roi enlivened by the cider and several glasses of wine related many anecdotes while georges to whom they were all familiar 
laughed at them mother du roi did not speak but sat at the board grim and austere glancing at her daughter-in-law with hatred in her heart madeleine did not speak nor did she eat she was depressed wherefore she had wished to come she knew that she was coming to a simple home she had formed no poetical ideas of those peasants but she had perhaps expected to find them somewhat more polished refined she recalled her own mother of whom she never spoke to any one a governess who had been betrayed and who had died of grief and shame when madeleine was twelve years old a stranger had had the little girl educated her father without doubt who was he she did not know positively but she had vague suspicions the meal was not yet over when customers entered shook hands with m du roi exclaimed on seeing his son and seating themselves at the wooden tables began to drink smoke and play dominoes the smoke from the clay pipes and penny cigars filled the room madeleine choked and asked can we go out i cannot remain here any longer old du roi grumbled at being disturbed madeleine rose and placed her chair at the door in order to wait until her father-in-law and his wife had finished their coffee and wine georges soon joined her would you like to stroll down to the seine joyfully she cried yes they descended the hillside hired a boat at croisset and spent the remainder of the afternoon beneath the willows in the soft warm spring air and rocked gently by the rippling waves of the river they returned at nightfall the evening repast by candlelight was more painful to madeleine than that of the morning neither father du roi nor his wife spoke when the meal was over madeleine drew her husband outside in order not to have to remain in that room the atmosphere of which was heavy with smoke and the fumes of liquor when they were alone he said you are already weary she attempted to protest he interrupted her i have seen it if you wish we will leave to-morrow she whispered i should like to go they walked along and entered a narrow path among high trees hedged in on either side by impenetrable brushwood she asked where are we he replied in the forest one of the largest in france madeleine on raising her head could see the stars between the branches and hear the rustling of the leaves she felt strangely nervous why she could not tell she seemed to be lost surrounded by perils abandoned alone beneath that vast vaulted sky she murmured i am afraid i should like to return very well we will on their return they found the old people in bed the next morning madeleine rose early and was ready to leave at daybreak when georges told his parents that they were going to return home they guessed whose wish it was his father asked simply shall i see you soon again yes in the summer time very well his mother grumbled i hope you will not regret what you have done georges gave them two hundred francs to appease them and the cab arriving at ten o'clock 
the couple kissed the old peasants and set out as they were descending the side of the hill duroy laughed you see said he i warned you i should however not have presented you to monsieur and madame duroy de cantel senior she laughed too and replied i am charmed now they are nice people who i am beginning to like very much i shall send them confections from paris then she murmured du roi de cantel we will say that we spent a week at your parents estate and drawing near him she kissed him saying good morning georges he replied good morning madeleine as he slipped his arm around her waist end of chapter nine recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter ten of bel ami or the history of a scoundrel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter ten jealousy the duroys had been in paris two days and the journalist had resumed work he had given up his own especial province to assume that of forestier and to devote himself entirely to politics on this particular evening he turned his steps toward home with a light heart as he passed a florist's on the rue notre dame de lorette he bought a bouquet of half-open roses for madeleine having forgotten his key on arriving at his door he rang and the servant answered his summons georges asked is madame at home yes sir in the dining-room he paused in astonishment to see covers laid for three the door of the salon being ajar he saw madeleine arranging in a vase on the mantelpiece a bunch of roses similar to his he entered the room and asked have you invited anyone to dinner she replied without turning her head and continuing the arrangement of her flowers yes and no it is my old friend count de vaudrec who is in the habit of dining here every monday and who will come now as he always has georges murmured very well he stopped behind her the bouquet in his hand the desire strong within him to conceal it to throw it away however he said here i have brought you some roses she turned to him with a smile and said ah how thoughtful of you and she kissed him with such evident affection that he felt consoled she took the flowers inhaled their perfume and put them in an empty vase then she said as she noted the effect now i am satisfied my mantelpiece looks pretty adding with an air of conviction vaudrec is charming you will become intimate with him at once a ring announced the count he entered as if he were at home after gallantly kissing madame duroy's hand he turned to her husband and cordially offered his hand saying how are you my dear duroy he had no longer that haughty air but was very affable one would have thought in the course of five minutes that the two men had known one another for ten years madeleine whose face was radiant said i will leave you together 
i have work to superintend in the kitchen the dinner was excellent and the count remained very late when he was gone madeleine said to her husband is he not nice he improves too on acquaintance he is a good true faithful friend ah without him she did not complete her sentence and georges replied yes he is very pleasant i think we shall understand each other well you do not know she said that we have work to do to-night before retiring i did not have time to tell you before dinner for vaudrec came la roche mathieu brought me some important news of morocco we must make a fine article of that let us set to work at once come take the lamp he carried the lamp and they entered the study madeleine leaned against the mantelpiece and having lighted a cigarette told him the news and gave him her plan of the article he listened attentively making notes as she spoke and when she had finished he raised objections took up the question and in his turn developed another plan his wife ceased smoking for her interest was aroused in following georges's line of thought from time to time she murmured yes yes very good excellent very forcible and when he had finished speaking she said now let us write it was always difficult for him to make a beginning and she would lean over his shoulder and whisper the phrases in his ear then he would add a few lines when their article was completed georges re-read it both he and madeleine pronounced it admirable and kissed one another with passionate admiration the article appeared with the signature of g du roi de cantel and made a great sensation m walter congratulated the author who soon became celebrated in political circles his wife too surprised him by the ingenuousness of her mind the cleverness of her wit and the number of her acquaintances at almost any time upon returning home he found in his salon a senator a deputy a magistrate or a general who treated madeleine with grave familiarity deputy la roche mathieu who dined at rue fontaine every tuesday was one of the largest stockholders of m walter's paper and the latter's colleague and associate in many business transactions duroy hoped later on that some of the benefits promised by him to forestier might fall to his share they would be given to madeleine's new husband that was all nothing was changed even his associates sometimes called him forestier and it made duroy furious at the dead he grew to hate the very name it was to him almost an insult even at home the obsession continued the entire house reminded him of charles one evening duroy who liked sweetmeats asked why do we never have sweets his wife replied pleasantly i never think of it because charles disliked them he interrupted her with an impatient gesture do you know i am getting tired of charles it is charles here charles there charles liked this charles liked that since charles is dead let him rest in peace 
madeleine ascribed her husband's burst of ill-humour to puerile jealousy but she was flattered and did not reply on retiring haunted by the same thought he asked did charles wear a cotton nightcap to keep the draught out of his ears she replied pleasantly no a lace one georges shrugged his shoulders and said scornfully what a bird from that time georges never called charles anything but poor charles with an accent of infinite pity one evening as duroy was smoking a cigarette at his window toward the end of june the heat awoke in him a desire for fresh air he asked my little mad would you like to go as far as the bois yes certainly they took an open carriage and drove to the avenue du bois de boulogne it was a sultry evening a host of cabs lined the drive one behind another when the carriage containing georges and madeleine reached the turning which led to the fortifications they kissed one another and madeleine stammered in confusion we are as childish as we were at rouen the road they followed was not so much frequented a gentle breeze rustled the leaves of the trees the sky was studded with brilliant stars and georges murmured as he pressed his wife to his breast oh my little mad she said to him do you remember how gloomy the forest at canteleu was it seemed to me that it was full of horrible beasts and that it was interminable while here it is charming one can feel the caressing breezes and i know that sevres is on the other side he replied in our forests there are nothing but stags foxes roebucks and boars with here and there a forester's house he paused for a moment and then asked did you come here in the evening with charles occasionally she replied frequently he felt a desire to return home at once forestier's image haunted him however he could think of nothing else the carriage rolled on toward the arc de triomphe and joined the stream of carriages returning home as georges remained silent his wife who divined his thoughts asked in her soft voice of what are you thinking for half an hour you have not uttered a word he replied with a sneer i am thinking of all those fools who kiss one another and i believe truly that there is something else to be done in life she whispered yes but it is nice sometimes it is nice when one has nothing better to do georges's thoughts were busy with the dead he said to himself angrily i am foolish to worry to torment myself as i have done after remonstrating thus with himself he felt more reconciled to the thought of forestier and felt like exclaiming good evening old fellow madeleine who was bored by his silence asked shall we go to tortoni's for ices before returning home he glanced at her from his corner and thought she is pretty so much the better tit for tat my comrade but if they begin again to annoy me with you it will get somewhat hot at the north pole then he replied certainly my darling 
and before she had time to think he kissed her it seemed to madeleine that her husband's lips were icy however he smiled as usual and gave her his hand to assist her to alight at the cafe End of chapter 10 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 11, Part 1 of Bellamy, or the History of a Scoundrel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Martin Giessen Bellamy or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter eleven madame walter takes a hand part one on entering the office the following day du roi sought boisrenard and told him to warn his associates not to continue the farce of calling him forestier or there would be war when duroy returned an hour later no one called him by that name from the office he proceeded to his home and hearing the sound of ladies voices in the drawing-room he asked the servant who is here madame walter and madame de marelle was the reply his heart pulsated violently as he opened the door clotilde was seated by the fireplace it seemed to georges that she turned pale on perceiving him having greeted madame walter and her two daughters seated like sentinels beside her he turned to his former mistress she extended her hand he took and pressed it as if to say i love you still she returned the pressure he said have you been well since we last met yes have you bel ami and turning to madeleine she added will you permit me to call him bel ami certainly my dear i will permit you anything you wish a shade of irony lurked beneath those words uttered so pleasantly madame walter mentioned a fencing match to be given at jacques rival's apartments the proceeds to be devoted to charities and in which many society ladies were going to assist she said it will be very entertaining but i am in despair for we have no one to escort us my husband having an engagement du roy offered his services at once she accepted saying my daughters and i shall be very grateful he glanced at the younger of the two girls and thought little suzanne is not at all bad not at all she resembled a doll being very small and dainty with a well-proportioned form a pretty delicate face blue-grey eyes a fair skin and curly flaxen hair her elder sister rose was plain one of those girls to whom no attention is ever paid her mother rose and turning to georges said i shall count on you next thursday at two o'clock he replied count upon me madame when the door closed upon madame walter madame de marelle in her turn rose au revoir bel ami this time she pressed his hand and he was moved by that silent avowal i will go to see her to-morrow 
thought he left alone with his wife she laughed and looking into his eyes said madame walter has taken a fancy to you he replied incredulously nonsense but i know it she spoke of you to me with great enthusiasm she said she would like to find two husbands like you for her daughters fortunately she is not susceptible herself he did not understand her and repeated susceptible herself she replied in a tone of conviction oh madame walter is irreproachable her husband you know as well as i but she is different still she has suffered a great deal in having married a jew though she has been true to him she is a virtuous woman duroy was surprised i thought her a jewess she a jewess no indeed she is the prime mover in all the charitable movements at the madeleine she was even married by a priest i am not sure but that m walter went through the form of baptism georges murmured and she likes me yes if you were not married i should advise you to ask for the hand of suzanne would you not prefer her to rose he replied as he twisted his moustache Oh, the mother is not so bad madeleine replied i am not afraid of her at her age one does not begin to make conquests one should commence sooner georges thought if i might have had suzanne <sighs> then he shrugged his shoulders it is absurd her father would not have consented he determined to treat madame walter very considerately in order to retain her regard all that evening he was haunted by recollections of his love for clotilde he recalled their escapades her kindness he repeated to himself she is indeed nice yes i shall call upon her to-morrow when he had lunched the following morning he repaired to rue verneuil the same maid opened the door and with the familiarity of an old servant she asked is monsieur well he replied yes my child and entered the drawing-room in which some one was practising scales it was lorine he expected she would fall upon his neck she however rose ceremoniously bowed coldly and left the room with dignity her manner was so much like that of an outraged woman that he was amazed her mother entered he kissed her hand how much i have thought of you said he and i of you she replied they seated themselves and smiled as they gazed into one another's eyes my dear little clo i love you and i love you still still you did not miss me yes and no i was grieved but when i heard your reason i said to myself bah he will return to me some day i dared not come i did not know how i should be received i dared not but i longed to come now tell me what ails lorine she scarcely bade me good morning and left the room with an angry air i do not know but one cannot mention you to her since your marriage 
i really believe she is jealous nonsense yes my dear she no longer calls you bel ami but monsieur forestier instead du roi coloured then drawing nearer the young woman he said kiss me she obeyed him where can we meet again he asked at rue de constantinople ah are the apartments not rented no i kept them you did yes i thought you would return his heart bounded joyfully she loved him then with a lasting love he whispered i adore you then he asked is your husband well yes very well he has just been home for a month he went away the day before yesterday du roi could not suppress a smile how opportunely that always happens she replied naively yes it happens opportunely but he is not in the way when he is here is he that is true he is a charming man how do you like your new life tolerably my wife is a comrade an associate nothing more as for my heart i understand but she is good yes she does not trouble me he drew near clotilde and murmured when shall we meet again to-morrow if you will yes to-morrow at two o'clock he rose to take his leave somewhat embarrassed you know i intend to take back the rooms on rue de constantinople myself i wish to it is not necessary for you to pay for them she kissed his hand saying you may do as you like i am satisfied to have kept them until we met again and duroy took his leave very well satisfied when thursday came he asked madeleine are you going to the fencing match at rival's no i do not care about it i will go to the chamber of deputies georges called for madame walter in an open carriage for the weather was delightful he was surprised to find her looking so handsome and so young never had she appeared so fresh her daughter suzanne was dressed in pink her sister looked like her governess at rival's door was a long line of carriages duroy offered his arm to madame walter and they entered the entertainment was for the benefit of the orphans of the sixth ward under the patronage of all the wives of the senators and deputies who were connected with la vie francaise jacques rival received the arrivals at the entrance to his apartments then he pointed to a small staircase which led to the cellar in which were his shooting gallery and fencing room saying downstairs ladies downstairs the match will take place in the subterranean apartments pressing duroy's hand he said good evening bel ami duroy was surprised who told you about that name rival replied madame walter who thinks it is very pretty madame walter blushed yes i confess that if i knew you better i should do as little laurine and i should call you bel ami too it suits you admirably duroy laughed i beg you to do so madame she cast down her eyes no we are not well enough acquainted 
he murmured permit me to hope that we shall become so well we shall see said she end of chapter 11 part 1 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter Eleven, Part Two of Bellamy, or the History of a Scoundrel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Bellamy or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter eleven madame walter takes a hand part two they descended the stairs and entered a large room which was lighted by venetian lanterns and decorated with festoons of gauze nearly all the benches were filled with ladies who were chatting as if they were at a theatre madame walter and her daughters reached their seats in the front row du roi having obtained their places for them whispered i shall be obliged to leave you men cannot occupy the seats madame walter replied hesitatingly i should like to keep you just the same you could tell me the names of the participants see if you stand at the end of the seat you will not annoy any one she raised her large soft eyes to his and insisted come stay with us bel ami we need you he replied i obey with pleasure madame suddenly jacques rival's voice announced we will begin ladies then followed the fencing match duroy retained his place beside the ladies and gave them all the necessary information when the entertainment was over and all expenses were paid two hundred and twenty francs remained for the orphans of the sixth ward duroy escorting the walters awaited his carriage when seated face to face with madame walter he met her troubled but caressing glance egad i believe she is affected thought he and he smiled as he recognized the fact that he was really successful with the female sex for madame de marel since the renewal of their relations seemed to love him madly with a light heart he returned home madeleine was awaiting him in the drawing-room i have some news said she the affair with morocco is becoming complicated france may send an expedition out there in several months in any case the ministry will be overthrown and la roche will profit by the occasion duroy in order to draw out his wife pretended not to believe it france would not be silly enough to commence any folly with tunis she shrugged her shoulders impatiently i tell you she will you do not understand that it is a question of money you are as simple as forestier her object was to wound and irritate him but he only smiled and replied what as simple as that stupid fellow she ceased and murmured oh georges he added poor devil in a tone of profound pity madeleine turned her back upon him scornfully after a moment of silence she continued 
we shall have some company tuesday madame la roche mathieu is coming here to dine with my countess de percemur will you invite rival and norbert de varenne i shall go to mesdames walter and de marelle to-morrow perhaps too we may have madame rissolin duroy replied very well i will see to rival and norbert the following day he thought he would anticipate his wife's visit to madame walter and attempt to find out if she really was in love with him he arrived at boulevard malesherbes at two o'clock he was ushered into the salon and waited finally madame walter appeared and offered him her hand cordially what good wind blows you here no good wind but a desire to see you some power has impelled me hither i do not know why i have nothing to say except that i have come here i am pardon the morning call and the candour of my explanation he uttered those words with a smile upon his lips and a serious accent in his voice in her astonishment she stammered with a blush but indeed i do not understand you surprise me he added it is a declaration made in jest in order not to startle you they were seated near each other she took the matter as a jest is it a declaration seriously yes for a long time i have wished to make it but i dared not they say you are so austere so rigid she had recovered her self-possession and replied why did you choose to-day i do not know then he lowered his voice or rather because i have thought only of you since yesterday suddenly turning pale she gasped come enough of this childishness let us talk of something else but he fell upon his knees before her she tried to rise he prevented her by twining his arms about her waist and repeated in a passionate voice yes it is true that i have loved you madly for some time do not answer me i am mad i love you oh if you only knew how i love you she could utter no sound in her agitation she repulsed him with both hands for she could feel his breath upon her cheek he rose suddenly and attempted to embrace her but gaining her liberty for a moment she escaped him and ran from chair to chair he considering such pursuit beneath his dignity sank into a chair buried his face in his hands and feigned to sob convulsively then he rose cried adieu adieu and fled in the hall he took his cane calmly and left the house saying christi i believe she loves me he went at once to the telegraph office to send a message to clotilde appointing a rendezvous for the next day on entering the house at his usual time he said to his wife well is everyone coming to dinner she replied yes all but madame walter who is uncertain as to whether she can come she acted very strangely never mind perhaps she can manage it anyway he replied 
she will come he was not however certain and was rendered uneasy until the day of the dinner that morning madeleine received a message from madame walter to this effect i have succeeded in arranging matters and i shall be with you but my husband cannot accompany me duroy thought i did right not to return there she has calmed down still he awaited her arrival anxiously she appeared very composed somewhat reserved and haughty he was very humble very careful and submissive mesdames la roche-mathieu and rissolin were accompanied by their husbands madame de marelle looked bewitching in an odd combination of yellow and black at duras right sat madame walter and he spoke to her only of serious matters with exaggerated respect from time to time he glanced at clotilde she is really very pretty and fresh-looking thought he but madame walter attracted him by the difficulty of the conquest she took her leave early i will escort you said he she declined his offer he insisted why do you not want me you wound me deeply do not let me feel that i am not forgiven you see that i am calm she replied you cannot leave your guests thus he smiled oh, i shall be absent twenty minutes no one will even notice it if you refuse me you will break my heart very well she whispered i will accept when they were seated in the carriage he seized her hand and kissing it passionately said i love you i love you let me tell it to you i will not touch you i only wish to repeat that i love you she stammered after what you promised me it is too bad too bad he seemed to make a great effort then he continued in a subdued voice see how i can control myself and yet let me only tell you this i love you yes let me go home with you and kneel before you five minutes to utter those three words and gaze upon your beloved face she suffered him to take her hand and replied in broken accents no i cannot i do not wish to think of what my servants my daughters would say no no it is impossible he continued i cannot live without seeing you whether it be at your house or elsewhere i must see you for only a moment each day that i may touch your hand breathe the air stirred by your gown contemplate the outlines of your form and see your beautiful eyes she listened tremblingly to the musical language of love and made answer no it is impossible be silent he spoke very low he whispered in her ear comprehending that it was necessary to win that simple woman gradually to persuade her to appoint a meeting where she willed at first and later on where he willed listen i must see you i will wait at your door like a beggar if you do not come down i will come to you but i shall see you to-morrow 
she repeated no do not come i shall not receive you think of my daughters then tell me where i can meet you in the street it matters not where at any hour you wish provided that i can see you i will greet you i will say i love you and then go away she hesitated almost distracted as the coupe stopped at the door she whispered hastily i will be at la trinite to-morrow at half past three after alighting she said to her coachman take monsieur du roi home when he returned his wife asked where have you been he replied in a low voice i have been to send an important telegram madame de marel approached him you must take me home bel ami you know that i only dine so far from home on that condition turning to madeleine she asked you are not jealous madame du roi replied slowly no not at all the guests departed clotilde enveloped in laces whispered to madeleine at the door your dinner was perfect in a short while you will have the best political salon in paris when she was alone with georges she said oh my darling bel ami i love you more dearly every day the cab rolled on and georges thoughts were with madame walter end of chapter eleven recording by martin giessen in hazelmere surrey chapter twelve of bel ami or the history of a scoundrel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin giessen bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter twelve a meeting and the result the july sun shone upon the place de la trinite which was almost deserted duroy drew out his watch it was only three o'clock he was half an hour too early he laughed as he thought of the place of meeting he entered the sacred edifice of la trinite the coolness within was refreshing here and there an old woman kneeled at prayer her face in her hands duroy looked at his watch again it was not yet a quarter past three he took a seat regretting that he could not smoke at the end of the church near the choir he could hear the measured tread of a corpulent man whom he had noticed when he entered suddenly the rustle of a gown made him start it was she he arose and advanced quickly she did not offer him her hand and whispered i have only a few minutes you must kneel near me so that no one will notice us she proceeded to a side aisle after saluting the host on the high altar took a footstool and kneeled down georges took one beside it and when they were in the attitude of prayer he said thank you thank you i adore you i should like to tell you constantly how i began to love you how i was conquered the first time i saw you will you permit me some day to unburden my heart to explain all to you she replied between her fingers 
i am mad to let you speak to me thus mad to have come hither mad to do as i have done to let you believe that this this adventure can have any results forget it and never speak to me of it again she paused he replied i expect nothing i hope nothing i love you whatever you may do i will repeat it so often with so much force and ardour that you will finally understand me and reply i love you too he felt her frame tremble as she involuntarily repeated i love you too he was overcome by astonishment oh my god she continued incoherently should i say that to you i feel guilty despicable i who have two daughters but i cannot cannot i never thought it was stronger than i listen listen i have never loved any other but you i swear it i have loved you a year in secret i have suffered and struggled i can no longer i love you she wept and her bowed form was shaken by the violence of her emotion georges murmured give me your hand that i may touch may press it she slowly took her hand from her face he seized it saying i should like to drink your tears placing the hand he held upon his heart he asked do you feel it beat in a few moments the man georges had noticed before passed by them when madame walter heard him near her she snatched her fingers from georges's clasp and covered her face with them after the man had disappeared duroy asked hoping for another place of meeting than la trinite where shall i see you to-morrow she did not reply she seemed transformed into a statue of prayer he continued shall i meet you to-morrow at parc monceau she turned a livid face toward him and said unsteadily leave me leave me now go go away for only five minutes i suffer too much near you i want to pray go let me pray alone five minutes let me ask god to pardon me to save me leave me five minutes she looked so pitiful that he rose without a word and asked with some hesitation shall i return presently she nodded her head in the affirmative and he left her she tried to pray she closed her eyes in order not to see georges she could not pray she could only think of him she would rather have died than have fallen thus she had never been weak she murmured several words of supplication she knew that all was over that the struggle was in vain she did not however wish to yield but she felt her weakness some one approached with a rapid step she turned her head it was a priest she rose ran toward him and clasping her hands she cried save me save me he stopped in surprise what do you want madame i want you to save me have pity on me if you do not help me i am lost he gazed at her wondering if she were mad 
what can i do for you the priest was a young man somewhat inclined to corpulence receive my confession said she and counsel me sustain me tell me what to do he replied i confess every saturday from three to six seizing his arm she repeated no now at once at once it is necessary he is here in this church he is waiting for me the priest asked who is waiting for you a man who will be my ruin if you do not save me i can no longer escape him i am too weak too weak she fell upon her knees sobbing oh father have pity upon me save me for god's sake save me she seized his gown that he might not escape her while he uneasily glanced around on all sides to see if any one noticed the woman at his feet finally seeing that he could not free himself from her he said rise i have the key to the confessional with me duroy having walked around the choir was sauntering down the nave when he met the stout bold man wandering about and he wondered what can he be doing here the man slackened his pace and looked at georges with the evident desire to speak to him when he was near him he bowed and said politely i beg your pardon sir for disturbing you but can you tell me when this church was built duroy replied i do not know i think it is twenty or twenty-five years it is the first time i have been here i have never seen it before feeling interested in the stranger the journalist continued it seems to me that you are examining into it very carefully the man replied i am not visiting the church i have an appointment he paused and in a few moments added it is very warm outside duroy looked at him and suddenly thought that he resembled forestier are you from the provinces he asked yes i am from rennes and did you sir enter this church from curiosity no i am waiting for a lady and with a smile upon his lips he walked away he did not find madame walter in the place in which he had left her and was surprised she had gone he was furious then he thought she might be looking for him and he walked around the church not finding her he returned and seated himself on the chair she had occupied hoping that she would rejoin him there soon he heard the sound of a voice he saw no one whence came it he rose to examine into it and saw in a chapel near by the doors of the confessionals he drew nearer in order to see the woman whose voice he heard he recognized madame walter she was confessing at first he felt a desire to seize her by the arm and drag her away then he seated himself near by and bided his time he waited quite a while at length madame walter rose turned saw him and came toward him her face was cold and severe sir said she i beseech you not to accompany me not to follow me and not to come to my house alone you will not be admitted adieu 
and she walked away in a dignified manner he permitted her to go because it was against his principles to force matters as the priest in his turn issued from the confessional he advanced toward him and said if you did not wear a gown i would give you a sound thrashing then he turned upon his heel and left the church whistling in the doorway he met the stout gentleman when duroy passed him they bowed the journalist then repaired to the office of la vie francaise as he entered he saw by the clerk's busy air that something of importance was going on and he hastened to the manager's room the latter exclaimed joyfully as duroy entered what luck here is bel ami he stopped in confusion and apologized i beg your pardon i am very much bothered by circumstances and then i hear my wife and daughter call you bel ami from morning until night and i have acquired the habit myself are you displeased georges laughed not at all m walter continued very well then i will call you bel ami as every one else does great changes have taken place the ministry has been overthrown marot is to form a new cabinet he has chosen general boutin d'acre as minister of war and our friend la roche mathieu as minister of foreign affairs we shall all be very busy i must write a leading article a simple declaration of principles then i must have something interesting on the morocco question you must attend to that duroy reflected a moment and then replied i have it i will give you an article on the political situation of our african colony and he proceeded to prepare m walter an outline of his work which was nothing but a modification of his first article on souvenirs of a soldier in africa the manager having read the article said it is perfect you are a treasure many thanks duroy returned home to dinner delighted with his day notwithstanding his failure at la trinite his wife was awaiting him anxiously she exclaimed on seeing him you know that laroche is minister of foreign affairs yes i have just written an article on that subject how do you remember the first article we wrote on souvenirs of a soldier in africa well i revised and corrected it for the occasion she smiled ah yes that will do very well at that moment the servant entered with a dispatch containing these words without any signature i was beside myself pardon me and come to-morrow at four o'clock to parc monceau he understood the message and with a joyful heart slipped the telegram into his pocket during dinner he repeated the words to himself as he interpreted them they meant i yield i am yours where and when you will he laughed madeleine asked what is it nothing much i was thinking of a comical old priest i met a short while since duroy arrived at the appointed hour the following day the benches were all occupied by people trying to escape from the heat and by nurses with their charges he found madame walter in a little antique ruin she seemed unhappy and anxious 
when he had greeted her she said how many people there are in the garden he took advantage of the occasion yes that is true shall we go somewhere else where it matters not where for a drive for instance you can lower the shade on your side and you will be well concealed yes i should like that better i shall die of fear here very well meet me in five minutes at the gate which opens on the boulevard i will fetch a cab when they were seated in the cab she asked where did you tell the coachman to drive to georges replied do not worry he knows he had given the man his address on the rue de constantinople madame walter said to duroy you cannot imagine how i suffer on your account how i am tormented tortured yesterday i was harsh but i wanted to escape you at any price i was afraid to remain alone with you have you forgiven me he pressed her hand yes yes why should i not forgive you loving you as i do she looked at him with a beseeching air listen you must promise to respect me otherwise i could never see you again at first he did not reply a smile lurked beneath his moustache then he murmured i am your slave she told him how she had discovered that she loved him on learning that he was to marry madeleine forestier suddenly she ceased speaking the carriage stopped duroy opened the door where are we she asked he replied alight and enter the house we shall be undisturbed there where are we she repeated at my rooms they are my bachelor apartments which i have rented for a few days that we might have a corner in which to meet she clung to the cab startled at the thought of a tete-a-tete -tete, and stammered no no i do not want to he said firmly i swear to respect you come you see that people are looking at us that a crowd is gathering around us make haste and he repeated i swear to respect you she was terror-stricken and rushed into the house she was about to ascend the stairs he seized her arm it is here on the ground floor when he had closed the door he showered kisses upon her neck her eyes her lips in spite of herself she submitted to his caresses and even returned them hiding her face and murmuring in broken accents i swear that i have never had a lover while he thought that is a matter of indifference to me End of chapter 12 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 13, part 1 of Bel Ami, or The History of a Scoundrel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Martin Giessen Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel, by Guy de Maupassant, translator unknown. Chapter Thirteen, Madame de Marel, Part One. Autumn had come. The Duroises had spent the entire summer in Paris, leading a vigorous campaign in La Vie Française in favour of the new cabinet. Although it was only the early part of October, 
the chamber was about to resume its sessions for affairs in morocco were becoming menacing the celebrated speech made by count de lambert sarrazin had furnished duroy with material for ten articles on the algerian colony la vie francaise had gained considerable prestige by its connection with the power it was the first to give political news and every newspaper in paris and the provinces sought information from it it was quoted feared and began to be respected it was no longer the organ of a group of political intriguers but the avowed mouthpiece of the cabinet la roche mathieu was the soul of the journal and duroy his speaking trumpet m walter retired discreetly into the background madeleine's salon became an influential centre in which several members of the cabinet met every week the president of the council had even dined there twice the minister of foreign affairs was quite at home at the du Roy's. he came at any hour bringing dispatches or information which he dictated either to the husband or wife as if they were his secretaries after the minister had departed when du Roy was alone with madeleine he uttered threats and insinuations against the parvenu as he called him his wife simply shrugged her shoulders scornfully repeating become a minister and you can do the same until then be silent his reply was no one knows of what i am capable perhaps they will find out some day she answered philosophically he who lives will see the morning of the reopening of the chamber duroy lunched with la roche mathieu in order to receive instructions from him before the session for a political article the following day in la vie francaise which was to be a sort of official declaration of the plans of the cabinet after listening to la roche mathieu's eloquence for some time with jealousy in his heart duroy sauntered slowly toward the office to commence his work for he had nothing to do until four o'clock at which hour he was to meet madame de marelle at rue de constantinople they met there regularly twice a week mondays and wednesdays on entering the office he was handed a sealed dispatch it was from madame walter and read thus it is absolutely necessary that i should see you to-day it is important expect me at two o'clock at rue de constantinople i can render you a great service your friend until death virginie he exclaimed heavens what a bore and left the office at once too much annoyed to work for six weeks he had ineffectually tried to break with madame walter at three successive meetings she had been a prey to remorse and had overwhelmed her lover with reproaches angered by those scenes and already weary of the dramatic woman he had simply avoided her hoping that the affair would end in that way but she persecuted him with her affection summoned him at all times by telegrams to meet her at street corners in shops or public gardens she was very different from what he had fancied she would be 
trying to attract him by actions ridiculous in one of her age it disgusted him to hear her call him my rat my dog my treasure my jewel my blue bird and to see her assume a kind of childish modesty when he approached it seemed to him that being the mother of a family a woman of the world she should have been more sedate and have yielded with tears if she chose but with the tears of a dido and not of a juliette he never heard her call him little one or baby without wishing to reply old woman or to take his hat with an oath and leave the room at first they had often met at rue de constantinople but duroy who feared an encounter with madame de marel invented a thousand and one pretexts in order to avoid that rendezvous he was therefore obliged to either lunch or dine at her house daily when she would clasp his hand under cover of the table or offer him her lips behind the doors above all georges enjoyed being thrown so much in contact with suzanne she made sport of everything and everybody with cutting appropriateness at length however he began to feel an unconquerable repugnance to the love lavished upon him by the mother he could no longer see her hear her nor think of her without anger he ceased calling upon her replying to her letters and yielding to her appeals she finally divined that he no longer loved her and the discovery caused her unutterable anguish but she watched him followed him in a cab with drawn blinds to the office to his house in the hope of seeing him pass by he would have liked to strangle her but he controlled himself on account of his position on la vie francaise and he endeavoured by means of coldness and even at times harsh words to make her comprehend that all was at an end between them then too she persisted in devising ruses for summoning him to rue de constantinople and he was in constant fear that the two women would some day meet face to face at the door on the other hand his affection for madame de marelle had increased during the summer they were both bohemians by nature they took excursions together to argenteuil bougival maison and poissy and when he was forced to return and dine at madame walter's he detested his mature mistress more thoroughly as he recalled the youthful one he had just left he was congratulating himself upon having freed himself almost entirely from the former's clutches when he received the telegram above mentioned he re-read it as he walked along he thought what does that old owl want with me i am certain she has nothing to tell me except that she adores me however i will see perhaps there is some truth in it clotilde is coming at four i must get rid of the other one at three or soon after provided they do not meet what jades women are as he uttered those words he was reminded of his wife who was the only one who did not torment him she lived by his side and seemed to love him very much at the proper time 
for she never permitted anything to interfere with her ordinary occupations of life he strolled toward the appointed place of meeting mentally cursing madame walter ah oh, i will receive her in such a manner that she will not tell me anything first of all i will give her to understand that i shall never cross her threshold again he entered to await her she soon arrived and seeing him exclaimed ah you received my dispatch how fortunate yes i received it at the office just as i was setting out for the chamber what do you want he asked ungraciously she had raised her veil in order to kiss him and approached him timidly and humbly with the air of a beaten dog how unkind you are to me how harshly you speak what have i done to you you do not know what i have suffered for you he muttered are you going to begin that again she stood near him awaiting a smile a word of encouragement to cast herself into his arms and whispered you need not have won me to treat me thus you might have left me virtuous and happy do you remember what you said to me in the church and how you forced me to enter this house and now this is the way you speak to me receive me my god my god how you maltreat me he stamped his foot and said violently enough be silent i can never see you a moment without hearing that refrain you were mature when you gave yourself to me i am much obliged to you i am infinitely grateful but i need not be tied to your apron-strings until i die you have a husband and i a wife neither of us is free it was all a caprice and now it is at an end she said how brutal you are how coarse and villainous no i was no longer a young girl but i had never loved never wavered in my dignity he interrupted her i know it you have told me that twenty times but you have had two children she drew back as if she had been struck oh georges and pressing her hands to her heart she burst into tears when she began to weep he took his hat ah you are crying again good evening is it for this that you sent for me she took a step forward in order to bar the way and drawing a handkerchief from her pocket she wiped her eyes her voice grew steadier no i came to to give you political news to give you the means of earning fifty thousand francs or even more if you wish to suddenly softened he asked how by chance last evening i heard a conversation between my husband and la roche walter advised the minister not to let you into the secret for you would expose it duroy placed his hat upon a chair and listened attentively they are going to take possession of morocco why i lunched with laroche this morning and he told me the cabinet's plans no my dear they have deceived you because they feared their secret would be made known sit down said georges he sank into an armchair and she drew up a stool and took her seat at his feet she continued 
as i think of you continually i pay attention to what is talked of around me and she proceeded to tell him what she had heard relative to the expedition to tangiers which had been decided upon the day that laroche assumed his office she told him how they had little by little bought up through agents who aroused no suspicions the moroccan loan which had fallen to sixty-four or sixty-five francs how when the expedition was entered upon the french government would guarantee the debt and their friends would make fifty or sixty millions he cried are you sure of that she replied yes i am sure he continued that is indeed fine as for that rascal of a laroche let him beware i will get his ministerial carcass between my fingers yet then after a moment's reflection he muttered one might profit by that you too can buy some stock said she it is only seventy-two francs he replied but i have no ready money she raised her eyes to his eyes full of supplication i have thought of that my darling and if you love me a little you will let me lend it to you he replied abruptly almost harshly no indeed she whispered imploringly listen there is something you can do without borrowing money i intended buying ten thousand francs worth of the stock instead i will take twenty thousand and you can have half there will be nothing to pay at once if it succeeds we will make seventy thousand francs if not you will owe me ten thousand which you can repay at your pleasure he said again no i do not like those combinations she tried to persuade him by telling him that she advanced nothing that the payments were made by walter's bank she pointed out to him that he had led the political campaign in la vie francaise and that he would be very simple not to profit by the results he had helped to bring about as he still hesitated she added it is in reality walter who will advance the money and you have done enough for him to offset that sum very well said he i will do it if we lose i will pay you back ten thousand francs she was so delighted that she rose took his head between her hands and kissed him at first he did not repulse her but when she grew more lavish with her caresses he said come that will do she gazed at him sadly oh georges i can no longer even embrace you no not to-day i have a headache she reseated herself with docility at his feet and asked will you dine with us to-morrow it would give me such pleasure he hesitated at first but dared not refuse yes certainly thank you dearest she rubbed her cheek against the young man's vest as she did so one of her long black hairs caught on a button she twisted it tightly around then she twisted another around another button and so on when he rose he would tear them out of her head and would carry away with him unwittingly a lock of her hair it would be an invisible bond between them 
involuntarily he would think would dream of her he would love her a little more the next day suddenly he said i must leave you for i am expected at the chamber for the close of the session i cannot be absent to-day she sighed already then adding resignedly go my darling but you will come to dinner to-morrow she rose abruptly for a moment she felt a sharp stinging pain as if needles had been stuck into her head but she was glad to have suffered for him adieu said she he took her in his arms and kissed her eyes coldly then she offered him her lips which he brushed lightly as he said come come let us hurry it is after three o'clock she passed out before him saying to-morrow at seven he repeated her words and they separated End of chapter 13 part 1 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 13 part 2 of Bel Ami or the History of a Scoundrel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Martin Giessen Bel Ami or the History of a Scoundrel by Guy de Maupassant Translator Unknown Chapter 13 Madame de Marelle Part 2 Du Roy returned at four o'clock to await his mistress. She was somewhat late, because her husband had come home for a week. She asked, Can you come to dinner to-morrow? He will be delighted to see you. No, I dine at the Walters. We have a great many political and financial matters to talk over. She took off her hat. He pointed to a bag on the mantelpiece. I bought you some sweetmeats. She clapped her hands. What a darling you are! She took them, tasted one, and said, mm, They are delicious. I shall not leave one. Come, sit down in the armchair. I will sit at your feet and eat my bonbons. He smiled as he saw her take the seat a short while since occupied by Madame Walter. She too called him darling, little one, dearest, and the words seemed to him sweet and caressing from her lips, while from Madame Walter's they irritated and nauseated him suddenly he remembered the seventy thousand francs he was going to make and bluntly interrupting madame de marelle's chatter he said listen my darling i am going to entrust you with a message to your husband tell him from me to buy to-morrow ten thousand francs worth of moroccan stock which is at seventy-two and i predict that before three months are past he will have made eighty thousand francs tell him to maintain absolute silence tell him that the expedition to tangiers is decided upon and that the french government will guarantee the moroccan debt it is a state secret i am confiding to you remember she listened to him gravely and murmured thank you i will tell my husband this evening you may rely upon him he will not speak of it he can be depended upon there is no danger she had eaten all of her bonbons and began to toy with the buttons on his vest 
suddenly she drew a long hair out of the buttonhole and began to laugh see here is one of madeleine's hairs you are a faithful husband then growing serious she examined the scarcely perceptible thread more closely and said it is not madeleine's it is dark he smiled it probably belongs to the housemaid but she glanced at the vest with the care of a police inspector and found a second hair twisted around a second button then she saw a third and turning pale and trembling somewhat she exclaimed oh some woman has left hairs around all your buttons in surprise he stammered why you, you are mad she continued to unwind the hairs and cast them upon the floor with her woman's instinct she had divined their meaning and gasped in her anger ready to cry she loves you and she wished you to carry away with you something of hers oh you are a traitor she uttered a shrill nervous cry oh it is an old woman's hair here is a white one you have taken a fancy to an old woman now then you do not need me keep the other one she rose he attempted to detain her and stammered no clou you are absurd i do not know whose it is listen stay see stay but she repeated keep your old woman keep her have a chain made of her hair of her grey hair there is enough for that hastily she donned her hat and veil and when he attempted to touch her she struck him in the face and made her escape while he was stunned by the blow when he found that he was alone he cursed madame walter bathed his face and went out vowing vengeance that time he would not pardon no indeed he strolled to the boulevard and stopped at a jeweller's to look at a chronometer which he had wanted for some time and which would cost eighteen hundred francs he thought with joy if i make my seventy thousand francs i can pay for it and he began to dream of all the things he would do when he got the money first of all he would become a deputy then he would buy the chronometer then he would speculate on change and then and then he did not enter the office preferring to confer with madeleine before seeing walter again and writing his article he turned toward home he reached rue drouot when he paused he had forgotten to inquire for count de vaudrec who lived on chaussee d'antin he retraced his steps with a light heart thinking of a thousand things of the fortune he would make of that rascal of a laroche and of old walter he was not at all uneasy as to clotilde's anger knowing that she would soon forgive him when he asked the janitor of the house in which count de vaudrec lived how is monsieur de vaudrec i have heard that he has been ailing of late the man replied the count is very ill sir they think he will not live through the night the gout has reached his heart du roy was so startled that he did not know what to do vaudrec dying he stammered thanks i will call again unconscious of what he was saying 
he jumped into a cab and drove home his wife had returned he entered her room out of breath did you know vaudrec is dying she was reading a letter and turning to him asked what did you say i said that vaudrec is dying of an attack of gout then he added what shall you do she rose her face was livid she burst into tears and buried her face in her hands she remained standing shaken by sobs torn by anguish suddenly she conquered her grief and wiping her eyes said i am going to him do not worry about me i do not know what time i shall return do not expect me he replied very well go they shook hands and she left in such haste that she forgot her gloves georges after dining alone began to write his article he wrote it according to the minister's instructions hinting to the readers that the expedition to morocco would not take place he took it when completed to the office conversed several moments with m walter and set out again smoking with a light heart he knew not why his wife had not returned he retired and fell asleep toward midnight madeleine came home georges sat up in bed and asked well he had never seen her so pale and agitated she whispered he is dead ah and he told you nothing nothing he was unconscious when i arrived questions which he dared not ask arose to georges lips lie down and rest said he she disrobed hastily and slipped into bed he continued had he any relatives at his deathbed only a nephew ah did he often see that nephew they had not met for ten years had he other relatives no i believe not will that nephew be his heir i do not know was vaudrec very rich yes very do you know what he was worth no not exactly one or two millions perhaps he said no more she extinguished the light he could not sleep he looked upon madame walter's promised seventy thousand francs as very insignificant suddenly he thought he heard madeleine crying in order to insure himself he asked are you asleep no her voice was tearful and unsteady he continued i forgot to tell you that your minister has deceived us how he gave her a detailed account of the combination prepared by laroche and walter when he concluded she asked how did you know that he replied pardon me if i do not tell you you have your means of obtaining information into which i do not inquire i have mine which i desire to keep i can vouch at any rate for the truth of my statements she muttered it may be possible i suspected that they were doing something without our knowledge as she spoke georges drew near her she paid no heed to his proximity however and turning toward the wall he closed his eyes and fell asleep End of chapter thirteen 
Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter Fourteen of Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel, by Guy de Maupassant. Translator unknown. Chapter Fourteen, The Will. The church was draped in black, and over the door a large escutcheon, surmounted by a coronet, announced to the passers-by that a nobleman was being buried. The ceremony was just over. Those present went out slowly, passing by the coffin, and by Count de Vaudrec's nephew, who shook hands and returned salutations. When Georges du Roy and his wife left the church, they walked along side by side on their way home. They did not speak. They were both preoccupied. At length Georges said, as if talking to himself, "'Truly it is very astonishing,' Madeleine asked, what my friend that vaudrec left us nothing she blushed and said why should he leave us anything had he any reason for doing so then after several moments of silence she continued perhaps there is a will at a lawyer's we should not know of it he replied that is possible for he was our best friend he dined with us twice a week he came at any time he was at home with us he loved you as a father he had no family no children no brothers nor sisters only a nephew yes there should be a will i would not care for much a remembrance to prove that he thought of us that he recognized the affection we felt for him we should certainly have a mark of friendship she said with a pensive and indifferent air it is possible that there is a will when they entered the house the footman handed madeleine a letter she opened it and offered it to her husband office of monsieur lamaneur notary seventeen rue des vosges madame kindly call at my office at a quarter past two o'clock tuesday wednesday or thursday on business which concerns you yours respectfully lamaneur georges in his turn coloured that is as it should be it is strange however that he should write to you and not to me for i am the head of the family legally shall we go at once she asked yes i should like to after luncheon they set out for monsieur lamaneur's office the notary was a short round man round all over his head looked like a ball fastened to another ball which was supported by legs so short that they too almost resembled balls he bowed as duroy and his wife were shown into his office pointed to seats and said turning to madeleine madame i sent for you in order to inform you of count de vaudrec's will which will be of interest to you georges could not help muttering i suspected that the notary continued i shall read you the document which is very brief i the undersigned paul emile cyprien gontran count de vaudrec sound in body and mind 
here express my last wishes as death might take me away at any moment i wish to take the precaution of drawing up my will to be deposited with m lamaneur having no direct heirs i bequeath all my fortune comprising stocks and bonds for six hundred thousand francs and landed property for five hundred thousand to madame claire madeleine du roi unconditionally i beg her to accept that gift from a dead friend as a proof of devoted profound and respectful affection the notary said that is all that document bears the date of august last and took the place of one of the same nature made two years ago in the name of madame claire madeleine forestier i have the first will which would prove in case of contestation on the part of the family that count de vaudrec had not changed his mind madeleine cast down her eyes her cheeks were pale georges nervously twisted his moustache the notary continued after a moment's pause it is of course understood that madame cannot accept that legacy without your consent du roy rose and said shortly i ask time for reflection the notary smiled bowed and replied pleasantly i comprehend the scruples which cause you to hesitate i may add that m de vaudrec's nephew who was informed this morning of his uncle's last wishes expresses himself as ready to respect them if he be given one hundred thousand francs in my opinion the will cannot be broken but a lawsuit would cause a sensation which you would probably like to avoid the world often judges uncharitably can you let me have your reply before saturday georges bowed and together with his wife left the office when they arrived home duroy closed the door and throwing his hat on the bed asked what were the relations between you and vaudrec madeleine who was taking off her veil turned around with a shudder between us yes between you and him one does not leave one's entire fortune to a woman unless she trembled and could scarcely take out the pins which fastened the transparent tissue then she stammered in an agitated manner you are mad you are you are you did not think he would leave you anything georges replied emphasizing each word yes he could have left me something me your husband his friend but not you my wife and his friend the distinction is material in the eyes of the world madeleine gazed at him fixedly it seems to me that the world would have considered a legacy from him to you very strange why because she hesitated then continued because you are my husband because you were not well acquainted because i have been his friend so long because his first will made during forestier's lifetime was already in my favour georges began to pace to and fro he finally said you cannot accept that she answered indifferently very well it is not necessary then to wait until saturday you can inform m lamaneur at once he paused before her 
and they gazed into one another's eyes as if by that mute and ardent interrogation they were trying to examine each other's consciences in a low voice he murmured come confess your relations she shrugged her shoulders you are absurd vaudrec was very fond of me very but there was nothing more never he stamped his foot you lie it is not possible she replied calmly it is so nevertheless he resumed his pacing to and fro then pausing again he said explain to me then why he left all his fortune to you she did so with a nonchalant air it is very simple as you said just now we were his only friends or rather i was his only friend for he knew me when a child my mother was a governess in his father's house he came here continually and as he had no legal heirs he selected me it is possible that he even loved me a little but what woman has never been loved thus he brought me flowers every monday you were never surprised at that and he never brought you any to-day he leaves me his fortune for the same reason because he had no one else to leave it to it would on the other hand have been extremely surprising if he had left it to you why what are you to him she spoke so naturally and so calmly that georges hesitated before replying it makes no difference we cannot accept that bequest under those conditions every one would talk about it and laugh at me my fellow journalists are already too much disposed to be jealous of me and to attack me i have to be especially careful of my honour and my reputation i cannot permit my wife to accept a legacy of that kind from a man whom rumour has already assigned to her as her lover forestier might perhaps have tolerated that but i shall not she replied gently very well my dear we will not take it it will be a million less in our pockets that is all georges paced the room and uttered his thoughts aloud thus speaking to his wife without addressing her yes a million so much the worse he did not think when making his will what a breach of etiquette he was committing he did not realize in what a false ridiculous position he was placing me he should have left half of it to me that would have made matters right he seated himself crossed his legs and began to twist the ends of his moustache as was his custom when annoyed uneasy or pondering over a weighty question madeleine took up a piece of embroidery upon which she worked occasionally and said i have nothing to say you must decide it was some time before he replied then he said hesitatingly the world would never understand how it was that vaudrec constituted you his sole heiress and that i allowed it to accept that legacy would be to avow guilty relations on your part and an infamous lack of self-respect on mine do you know how the acceptance of it might be interpreted we should have to find some adroit means of palliating it we should have to give people to suppose for instance that he divided his fortune between us giving half to you and half to me she said 
i do not see how that can be done since there is a formal will he replied oh that is very simple we have no children you can therefore deed me part of the inheritance in that way we can silence malignant tongues she answered somewhat impatiently i do not see how we can silence malignant tongues since the will is there signed by vaudrec he said angrily do you need to exhibit it or affix it to the door you are absurd we will say that the fortune was left us jointly by count de vaudrec that is all you cannot moreover accept the legacy without my authority i will only consent on the condition of a partition which will prevent me from becoming a laughing-stock for the world she glanced sharply at him as you will i am ready he seemed to hesitate again rose paced the floor and avoiding his wife's piercing gaze he said no decidedly no perhaps it would be better to renounce it altogether it would be more correct more honourable from the nature of the bequest even charitably disposed people would suspect illicit relations he paused before madeleine if you like my darling i will return to m lamaneur's alone to consult him and to explain the matter to him i will tell him of my scruples and i will add that we have agreed to divide it in order to avoid any scandal from the moment that i accept a portion of the inheritance it will be evident that there is nothing wrong i can say my wife accepts it because i her husband accept i who am the best judge of what she can do without compromising herself madeleine simply murmured as you wish he continued yes it will be as clear as day if that is done we inherit a fortune from a friend who wished to make no distinction between us thereby showing that his liking for you was purely platonic you may be sure that if he had given it a thought that is what he would have done he did not reflect he did not foresee the consequences as you said just now he offered you flowers every week he left you his wealth she interrupted him with a shade of annoyance i understand no more explanations are necessary go to the notary at once he stammered in confusion you are right i will go he took his hat and as he was leaving the room he asked shall i try to compromise with the nephew for fifty thousand francs she replied haughtily no give him the hundred thousand francs he demands and take them from my share if you wish abashed he murmured no we will share it after deducting fifty thousand francs each we will still have a million net then he added until later my little mad he proceeded to the notaries to explain the arrangement decided upon which he claimed originated with his wife the following day they signed a deed for five hundred thousand francs which madeleine du roi gave up to her husband on leaving the office as it was pleasant georges proposed that they take a stroll along the boulevard he was very tender very careful of her and laughed joyously while she remained pensive and grave 
it was a cold autumn day the pedestrians seemed in haste and walked along rapidly duroy led his wife to the shop into the windows of which he had so often gazed at the coveted chronometer shall i buy you some trinket he asked she replied indifferently as you like they entered the shop what would you prefer a necklace a bracelet or earrings the sight of the brilliant gems made her eyes sparkle in spite of herself as she glanced at the cases filled with costly baubles suddenly she exclaimed there is a lovely bracelet it was a chain very unique in shape every link of which was set with a different stone georges asked how much is that bracelet the jeweller replied three thousand francs sir if you will let me have it for two thousand five hundred i will take it the man hesitated then replied no sir it is impossible duroy said see here throw in this chronometer at fifteen hundred francs that makes four thousand and i will pay cash if you do not agree i will go somewhere else the jeweller finally yielded very well sir the journalist after leaving his address said you can have my initials g r c interlaced below a baron's crown engraved on the chronometer madeleine in surprise smiled and when they left the shop she took his arm quite affectionately she thought him very shrewd and clever he was right now that he had a fortune he must have a title they passed the vaudeville on their way and entering secured a box then they repaired to madame de marelle's at georges suggestion to invite her to spend the evening with them georges rather dreaded the first meeting with clotilde but she did not seem to bear him any malice or even to remember their disagreement the dinner which they took at a restaurant was excellent and the evening altogether enjoyable georges and madeleine returned home late the gas was extinguished and in order to light the way the journalist from time to time struck a match on reaching the landing on the first floor they saw their reflections in the mirror duroy raised his hand with the lighted match in it in order to distinguish their images more clearly and said with a triumphant smile the millionaires are passing by end of chapter 14 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter 15, Part 1 of Bel Ami or the History of a Scoundrel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Bel Ami or the History of a Scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter fifteen suzanne part one morocco had been conquered france the mistress of tangiers had guaranteed the debt of the annexed country it was rumoured that two ministers la roche mathieu being one of them had made twenty millions as for walter in a few days he had become one of the masters of the world a financier more omnipotent than a king 
he was no longer the jew walter the director of a bank the proprietor of a yellow newspaper he was monsieur walter the wealthy israelite and he wished to prove it knowing the straitened circumstances of the prince de carlsbourg who owned one of the fairest mansions on rue du faubourg saint honore he proposed to buy it he offered three million francs for it the prince tempted by the sum accepted his offer the next day walter took possession of his new dwelling then another idea occurred to him an idea of conquering all paris an idea a la bonaparte at that time every one was raving over a painting by the hungarian karl markovitch exhibited by jacques le noble and representing christ walking on the water art critics enthusiastically declared it to be the most magnificent painting of the age walter bought it thereby causing entire paris to talk of him to envy him to censure or approve his action he issued an announcement in the papers that every one was invited to come on a certain evening to see it du roy was jealous of m walter's success he had thought himself wealthy with the five hundred thousand francs extorted from his wife and now he felt poor as he compared his paltry fortune with the shower of millions around him his envious rage increased daily he cherished ill will toward every one toward the walters even toward his wife and above all toward the man who had deceived him made use of him and who dined twice a week at his house georges acted as his secretary agent mouthpiece and when he wrote at his dictation he felt a mad desire to strangle him laroche reigned supreme in the duroy household having taken the place of count de vaudrec he spoke to the servants as if he were their master georges submitted to it all like a dog which wishes to bite and dares not but he was often harsh and brutal to madeleine who merely shrugged her shoulders and treated him as one would a fretful child she was surprised too at his constant ill-humour and said i do not understand you you are always complaining your position is excellent his only reply was to turn his back upon her he declared that he would not attend m walter's fete that he would not cross the miserable jew's threshold for two months madame walter had written to him daily beseeching him to come to see her to appoint a meeting where he would in order that she might give him the seventy thousand francs she had made for him he did not reply and threw her letters into the fire not that he would have refused to accept his share of the profits but he enjoyed treating her scornfully trampling her under foot she was too wealthy he would be inflexible the day of the exhibition of the picture as madeleine chided him for not going he replied leave me in peace i shall remain at home after they had dined he said suddenly i suppose i shall have to go through with it 
get ready quickly i shall be ready in fifteen minutes she said as they entered the courtyard of the hotel de carlsbourg it was one blaze of light a magnificent carpet was spread upon the steps leading to the entrance and upon each one stood a man in livery as rigid as marble duroy's heart was torn with jealousy he and his wife ascended the steps and gave their wraps to the footman who approached them at the entrance to the drawing-room two children one in pink the other in blue handed bouquets to the ladies the rooms were already well filled the majority of the ladies were in street costumes a proof that they came thither as they would go to any exhibition the few who intended to remain to the ball which was to follow wore evening dress madame walter surrounded by friends stood in the second salon and received the visitors many did not know her and walked through the rooms as if in a museum without paying any heed to the host and hostess when virginie perceived du roi she grew livid and made a movement toward him then she paused and waited for him to advance he bowed ceremoniously while madeleine greeted her effusively georges left his wife near madame walter and mingled with the guests five drawing-rooms opened one into the other they were carpeted with rich oriental rugs and upon their walls hung paintings by the old masters as he made his way through the throng some one seized his arm and a fresh youthful voice whispered in his ear ah here you are at last naughty bel ami why do we never see you any more it was suzanne walter with her azure eyes and wealth of golden hair he was delighted to see her and apologized as they shook hands i have been so busy for two months that i have been nowhere she replied gravely that is too bad you have grieved us deeply for mamma and i adore you as for myself i cannot do without you if you are not here i am bored to death you see i tell you so frankly so that you will not remain away like that any more give me your arm i will show you christ walking on the water myself it is at the very end behind the conservatory papa put it back there so that every one would be obliged to go through the rooms it is astonishing how proud papa is of this house as they walked through the rooms all turned to look at that handsome man and that bewitching girl a well-known painter said there is a fine couple georges thought if my position had been made i would have married her why did i never think of it how could i have taken the other one what folly one always acts too hastily one never reflects sufficiently and longing bitter longing possessed him corrupting all his pleasure rendering life odious suzanne said you must come often bel ami we can do anything we like now papa is rich he replied oh you will soon marry some prince perhaps and we shall never meet any more she cried frankly oh oh i shall not i shall choose someone i love very dearly i am rich enough for two 
he smiled ironically and said i give you six months by that time you will be madame la marquise madame la duchesse or madame la princesse and you will look down upon me mademoiselle she pretended to be angry patted his arm with her fan and vowed that she would marry according to the dictates of her heart he replied we shall see you are too wealthy you too have inherited some money barely twenty thousand livres a year it is a mere pittance nowadays but your wife has the same yes we have a million together forty thousand a year we cannot even keep a carriage on that they had in the meantime reached the last drawing-room and before them lay the conservatory with its rare shrubs and plants to their left under a dome of palms was a marble basin on the edges of which four large swans of delft ware emitted the water from their beaks the journalist stopped and said to himself this is luxury this is the kind of house in which to live why can i not have one his companion did not speak he looked at her and thought once more if i only had taken her suddenly suzanne seemed to awaken from her reverie come said she dragging georges through a group which barred their way and turning him to the right before him surrounded by verdure on all sides was the picture one had to look closely at it in order to understand it it was a grand work the work of a master one of those triumphs of art which furnishes one for years with food for thought duroy gazed at it for some time and then turned away to make room for others suzanne's tiny hand still rested upon his arm she asked would you like a glass of champagne we will go to the buffet we shall find papa there slowly they traversed the crowded rooms suddenly georges heard a voice say that is la roche and madame du roi he turned and saw his wife passing upon the minister's arm they were talking in low tones and smiling into each other's eyes he fancied he saw some people whisper as they gazed at them and he felt a desire to fall upon those two beings and smite them to the earth his wife was making a laughing-stock of him who was she a shrewd little parvenu that was all he could never make his way with a wife who compromised him she would be a stumbling block in his path ah if he had foreseen if he had known he would have played for higher stakes what a brilliant match he might have made with little suzanne how could he have been so blind they reached the dining-room with its marble columns and walls hung with old gobelin tapestry walter spied his editor and hastened to shake hands he was beside himself with joy have you seen everything say suzanne have you shown him everything what a lot of people eh? have you seen prince de gersh he just drank a glass of punch then he pounced upon senator rissolin and his wife a gentleman greeted suzanne a tall slender man with fair whiskers and a worldly air georges heard her call him marquis de cazolles 
and he was suddenly inspired with jealousy how long had she known him since she had become wealthy no doubt he saw in him a possible suitor someone seized his arm it was norbert de varenne the old poet said this is what they call amusing themselves after a while they will dance then they will retire and the young girls will be satisfied take some champagne it is excellent georges scarcely heard his words he was looking for suzanne who had gone off with the marquis de cazolle he left norbert de varenne abruptly and went in pursuit of the young girl the thirsty crowd stopped him when he had made his way through it he found himself face to face with monsieur and madame de marelle he had often met the wife but he had not met the husband for some time the latter grasped both of his hands and thanked him for the message he had sent him by clotilde relative to the stocks duroy replied in exchange for that service i shall take your wife or rather offer her my arm husband and wife should always be separated End of chapter 15, part 1 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 15, part 2 of Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Martin Giessen Bel Ami, or the History of a Scoundrel by Guy de Maupassant Translator Unknown Chapter 15 Suzanne Part 2 Monsieur de Marelle bowed. Very well. If I lose you, we can meet here again in an hour. The two young people disappeared in the crowd, followed by the husband. Madame de Marel said, There are two girls who will have twenty or thirty millions each, and Suzanne is pretty in the bargain. He made no reply. His own thought coming from the lips of another irritated him he took clotilde to see the painting as they crossed the conservatory he saw his wife seated near la roche mathieu both of them almost hidden behind a group of plants they seemed to say we are having a meeting in public for we do not care for the world's opinion madame de marelle admired karl markovitch's painting and they turned to repair to the other rooms they were separated from monsieur de marelle he asked is laurine still vexed with me yes she refuses to see you and goes away when you are mentioned he did not reply the child's sudden enmity grieved and annoyed him suzanne met them at a door and cried oh here you are now bel ami you are going to be left alone for i shall take clotilde to see my room and the two women glided through the throng at that moment a voice at his side murmured Shosh it was madame walter she continued in a low voice how cruel you are how needlessly you inflict suffering upon me i bade suzanne take that woman away that i might have a word with you listen i must speak with you this evening or 
or you do not know what i shall do go into the conservatory you will find a door to the left through which you can reach the garden follow the walk directly in front of you at the end of it you will see an arbour expect me in ten minutes if you do not meet me i swear i will cause a scandal here at once he replied haughtily very well i shall be at the place you named in ten minutes but jacques rival detained him when he reached the alley he saw madame walter in front of him she cried ah here you are do you wish to kill me he replied calmly i beseech you none of that or i shall leave you at once throwing her arms around his neck she exclaimed what have i done to you that you should treat me so he tried to push her away you twisted your hair around my coat buttons the last time we met and it caused trouble between my wife and myself she shook her head ah oh, your wife would not care it was one of your mistresses who made a scene i have none indeed why do you never come to see me why do you refuse to dine with me even once a week i have no other thoughts than of you i suffer terribly you cannot understand that your image always present closes my throat stifles me and leaves me scarcely strength enough to move my limbs in order to walk so i remain all day in my chair thinking of you he looked at her in astonishment these were the words of a desperate woman capable of anything he however cherished a vague project and replied my dear love is not eternal one loves and one ceases to love when it lasts it becomes a drawback i want none of it however if you will be reasonable and will receive and treat me as a friend i will come to see you as formerly can you do that she murmured i can do anything in order to see you then it is agreed that we are to be friends nothing more she gasped it is agreed offering him her lips she cried in her despair one more kiss one last kiss he gently drew back no we must adhere to our rules she turned her head and wiped away two tears then drawing from her bosom a package of notes tied with pink ribbon she held it towards du roi here is your share of the profits in that moroccan affair i was so glad to make it for you here take it he refused no i cannot accept that money she became excited oh you will not refuse it now it is yours yours alone if you do not take it i will throw it in the sewer you will not refuse it georges he took the package and slipped it into his pocket we must return to the house you will take cold so much the better if i could but die she seized his hand kissed it passionately and fled toward the house he returned more leisurely and entered the conservatory with head erect and smiling lips his wife and laroche were no longer there the crowd had grown thinner suzanne leaning on her sister's arm advanced toward him in a few moments rose 
whom they teased about a certain count, turned upon her heel and left them. Du Roy, finding himself alone with Suzanne, said in a caressing voice, "'Listen, my dear little one, do you really consider me a friend?' why yes bel ami you have faith in me perfect faith do you remember what i said to you a while since about what about your marriage or rather the man you would marry yes well will you promise me one thing yes what is it to consult me when you receive a proposal and to accept no one without asking my advice yes i will gladly and it is to be a secret between us not a word to your father or mother not a word rival approached them saying mademoiselle your father wants you in the ballroom she said come bel ami but he refused for he had decided to leave at once wishing to be alone with his thoughts he went in search of his wife and found her drinking chocolate at the buffet with two strange men she introduced her husband without naming them in a short while he asked shall we go whenever you like she took his arm, and they passed through the almost deserted rooms. Madeleine asked, "'Where is Madame Walter? I should like to bid her good-bye.' "'It is unnecessary. She would try to keep us in the ballroom, and I have had enough.' "'You are right.' On the way home they did not speak, but when they had entered their room, madeleine without even taking off her veil said to him with a smile i have a surprise for you he growled ill-naturedly what is it guess i cannot make the effort the day after to-morrow is the first of january yes it is the season for new year's gifts yes here is yours which laroche handed me just now she gave him a small black box which resembled a jewel casket he opened it indifferently and saw the cross of the legion of honour he turned a trifle pale then smiled and said I should have preferred ten millions. That did not cost him much. She had expected a transport of delight, and was irritated by his indifference. You are incomprehensible. Nothing seems to satisfy you. He replied calmly, That man is only paying his debts. He owes me a great deal more she was astonished at his tone and said it is very nice however at your age he replied i should have much more he took the casket placed it on the mantelpiece and looked for some minutes at the brilliant star within it then he closed it with a shrug of his shoulders and began to prepare to retire L'Officiel of January the 1st announced that Monsieur Prosper Georges du Roy had been decorated with the Legion of Honour for exceptional services. The name was written in two words, and that afforded Georges more pleasure than the decoration itself. An hour after having read that notice, he received a note from Madame Walter, inviting him to come and bring his wife to dine with them that evening, to celebrate his distinction. 
at first he hesitated then throwing the letter in the fire he said to madeleine we shall dine at the walters this evening in her surprise she exclaimed why i thought you would never set your foot in their house again his sole reply was i have changed my mind when they arrived at rue du faubourg saint honore they found madame walter alone in the dainty boudoir in which she received her intimate friends she was dressed in black and her hair was powdered at a distance she appeared like an old lady in proximity like a youthful one are you in mourning asked madeleine she replied sadly yes and no i have lost none of my relatives but i have arrived at an age when one should wear sombre colours i wear it to-day to inaugurate it hitherto i have worn it in my heart the dinner was somewhat tedious suzanne alone talked incessantly rose seemed preoccupied the journalist was overwhelmed with congratulations after the meal when all repaired to the drawing-rooms madame walter detained him as they were about to enter the salon saying i will never speak of anything to you again only come to see me georges it is impossible for me to live without you i see you i feel you in my heart all day and all night it is as if i had drunk a poison which preyed upon me i cannot bear it i would rather be as an old woman to you i powdered my hair for that reason to-night but come here come from time to time as a friend he replied calmly very well it is unnecessary to speak of it again you see i came to-day on receipt of your letter walter who had preceded them with his two daughters and madeleine awaited du roi near the picture of christ walking on the water only think said he i found my wife yesterday kneeling before that painting as if in a chapel she was praying madame walter replied in a firm voice in a voice in which vibrated a secret exultation that christ will save my soul he gives me fresh courage and strength every time that i look at him and pausing before the picture she murmured how beautiful he is how frightened those men are and how they love him look at his head his eyes how simple and supernatural he is at the same time suzanne cried why he looks like you bel ami i am sure he looks like you the resemblance is striking she made him stand beside the painting and every one recognized the likeness duroy was embarrassed walter thought it very singular madeleine with a smile remarked that jesus looked more manly madame walter stood by motionless staring fixedly at her lover's face her cheeks as white as her hair end of chapter 15 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Chapter 16 of Bellamy 
or the history of a scoundrel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin giessen bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter sixteen divorce during the remainder of the winter the duroys often visited the walters georges too frequently dined there alone madeleine pleading fatigue and preferring to remain at home he had chosen friday as his day and madame walter never invited any one else on that evening it belonged to bel ami often in a dark corner or behind a tree in the conservatory madame walter embraced the young man and whispered in his ear i love you i love you i love you desperately but he always repulsed her coldly saying if you persist in that i will not come again toward the end of march people talked of the marriage of the two sisters rose was to marry dame rumour said count de la tour ivelin and suzanne the marquis de cazolles the subject of suzanne's possible marriage had not been broached again between her and georges until one morning the latter having been brought home by m walter to lunch he whispered to suzanne come let us give the fish some bread they proceeded to the conservatory in which was the marble basin containing the fish as georges and suzanne leaned over its edge they saw their reflections in the water and smiled at them suddenly he said in a low voice it is not right of you to keep secrets from me suzanne she asked what secrets bel ami do you remember what you promised me here the night of the fete no to consult me every time you received a proposal well well you have received one from whom you know very well no i swear i do not yes you do it is from that fop of a marquis de cazolles he is not a fop that may be but he is stupid he is no match for you who are so pretty so fresh so bright she asked with a smile what have you against him i nothing yes you have he is not all that you say he is he is a fool and an intriguer she glanced at him what ails you he spoke as if tearing a secret from the depths of his heart i am i am jealous of him she was astonished you yes i why because i love you and you know it then she said severely you are mad bel ami he replied i know that i am should i confess it i a married man to you a young girl i am worse than mad i am culpable wretched i have no possible hope and that thought almost destroys my reason when i hear that you are going to be married i feel murder in my heart you must forgive me suzanne he paused the young girl murmured half sadly half gaily it is a pity that you are married but what can you do it cannot be helped 
he turned towards her abruptly and said if i were free would you marry me she replied yes bel ami i would marry you because i love you better than any of the others he rose and stammering said thanks thanks do not i implore you say yes to any one wait a while promise me somewhat confused and without comprehending what he asked she whispered i promise duroy threw a large piece of bread into the water and fled without saying adieu as if he were beside himself suzanne in surprise returned to the salon when duroy arrived home he asked madeleine who was writing letters shall you dine at the walters friday i am going she hesitated no i am not well i prefer to remain here as you like no one will force you then he took up his hat and went out for some time he had watched and followed her knowing all her actions the time he had awaited had come at length on friday he dressed early in order as he said to make several calls before going to m walter's at about six o'clock after having kissed his wife he went in search of a cab he said to the cabman you can stop at number seventeen rue fontaine and remain there until i order you to go on then you can take me to the restaurant du coq faisan rue lafayette the cab rolled slowly on duroy lowered the shades when in front of his house he kept watch of it after waiting ten minutes he saw madeleine come out and go toward the boulevards when she was out of earshot he put his head out of the window and cried go on the cab proceeded on its way and stopped at the coq faisan georges entered the dining-room and ate slowly looking at his watch from time to time at seven thirty he left and drove to rue la rochefoucauld he mounted to the third story of a house in that street and asked the maid who opened the door is monsieur guibert de lorme at home yes sir he was shown into the drawing-room and after waiting some time a tall man with a military bearing and grey hair entered he was the police commissioner duroy bowed then said as i suspected my wife is with her lover in furnished apartments they have rented on rue des martyrs the magistrate bowed i am at your service sir very well i have a cab below and with three other officers they proceeded to the house in which duroy expected to surprise his wife one officer remained at the door to watch the exit on the second floor they halted duroy rang the bell and they waited in two or three minutes georges rang again several times in succession they heard a light step approach and a woman's voice evidently disguised asked who is there the police officer replied open in the name of the law the voice repeated who are you i am the police commissioner open or i will force the door the voice continued what do you want duroy interrupted it is i it is useless to try to escape us the footsteps receded and then returned georges said 
if you do not open we will force the door receiving no reply he shook the door so violently that the old lock gave way and the young man almost fell over madeleine who was standing in the antechamber in her petticoat her hair loosened her feet bare and a candle in her hand he exclaimed it is she we have caught them and he rushed into the room the commissioner turned to madeleine who had followed them through the rooms in one of which were the remnants of a supper and looking into her eyes said you are madame claire madeleine du roi lawful wife of monsieur prosper georges du roi here present she replied yes sir what are you doing here she made no reply the officer repeated his question still she did not reply he waited several moments and then said if you do not confess madame i shall be forced to inquire into the matter they could see a man's form concealed beneath the covers of the bed du roi advanced softly and uncovered the livid face of monsieur la roche mathieu the officer again asked who are you as the man did not reply he continued i am the police commissioner and i call upon you to tell me your name if you do not answer i shall be forced to arrest you in any case rise i will interrogate you when you are dressed in the meantime madeleine had regained her composure and seeing that all was lost she was determined to put a brave face upon the matter her eyes sparkled with the audacity of bravado and taking a piece of paper she lighted the ten candles in the candelabra as if for a reception that done she leaned against the mantelpiece took a cigarette out of a case and began to smoke seeming not to see her husband in the meantime the man in the bed had dressed himself and advanced the officer turned to him now sir will you tell me who you are he made no reply i see i shall have to arrest you then the man cried do not touch me i am inviolable du roi rushed towards him exclaiming i can have you arrested if i want to then he added this man's name is la roche mathieu minister of foreign affairs the officer retreated and stammered sir will you tell me who you are for once that miserable fellow has not lied i am indeed la roche mathieu minister and pointing to georges's breast he added and that scoundrel wears upon his coat the cross of honour which i gave him du roi turned pale with a rapid gesture he tore the decoration from his buttonhole and throwing it in the fire exclaimed that is what a decoration is worth which is given by a scoundrel of your order the commissioner stepped between them as they stood face to face saying gentlemen you forget yourselves and your dignity madeleine smoked on calmly a smile hovering about her lips the officer continued sir i have surprised you alone with madame du roi under suspicious circumstances what have you to say nothing do your duty the commissioner turned to madeleine 
do you confess madame that this gentleman is your lover she replied boldly i do not deny it that is sufficient the magistrate made several notes when he had finished writing the minister who stood ready coat upon arm hat in hand asked do you need me any longer sir can i go duroy addressed him with an insolent smile why should you go we have finished we will leave you alone together then taking the officer's arm he said let us go sir we have nothing more to do in this place an hour later georges du roi entered the office of la vie francaise monsieur walter was there he raised his head and asked what are you here why are you not dining at my house where have you come from georges replied with emphasis i have just found out something about the minister of foreign affairs what i found him alone with my wife in hired apartments the commissioner of police was my witness the minister is ruined are you not jesting no i am not i shall even write an article on it what is your object to overthrow that wretch that public malefactor georges placed his hat upon a chair and added woe to those whom i find in my path i never pardon the manager stammered but your wife i shall apply for a divorce at once a divorce yes i am master of the situation i shall be free i have a stated income i shall offer myself as a candidate in october in my native district where i am known i could not win any respect were i to be hampered with a wife whose honour was sullied she took me for a simpleton but since i have known her game i have watched her and now i shall get on for i shall be free georges rose i will write the item it must be handled prudently the old man hesitated then said do so it serves those right who are caught in such scrapes end of chapter sixteen recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter seventeen of bel ami or the history of a scoundrel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter seventeen the final plot three months had elapsed georges du roy's divorce had been obtained his wife had resumed the name of forestier as the walters were going to trouville on the fifteenth of july they decided to spend a day in the country before starting the day chosen was thursday and they set out at nine o'clock in the morning in a large six-seated carriage drawn by four horses they were going to lunch at st germain bel ami had requested that he might be the only young man in the party for he could not bear the presence of the marquis de cazolles 
at the last moment however it was decided that comte de la tour yvelin should go for he and rose had been betrothed a month the day was delightful georges who was very pale gazed at suzanne as they sat in the carriage and their eyes met madame walter was contented and happy the luncheon was a long and merry one before leaving for paris duroy proposed a walk on the terrace they stopped on the way to admire the view as they passed on georges and suzanne lingered behind the former whispered softly suzanne i love you madly she whispered in return i love you too bel ami he continued if i cannot have you for my wife i shall leave the country she replied ask papa perhaps he will consent he answered impatiently no i repeat that it is useless the door of the house would be closed against me i would lose my position on the journal and we would not even meet those are the consequences a formal proposal would produce they have promised you to the marquis de cazolles they hope you will finally say yes and they are waiting what can we do have you the courage to brave your father and mother for my sake yes truly yes well there is only one way it must come from you and not from me you are an indulged child they let you say anything and are not surprised at any audacity on your part listen then this evening on returning home go to your mother first and tell her that you want to marry me she will be very much agitated and very angry suzanne interrupted him oh mamma would be glad he replied quickly no no you do not know her she will be more vexed than your father but you must insist you must not yield you must repeat that you will marry me and me alone will you do so i will and on leaving your mother repeat the same thing to your father very decidedly well and then and then matters will reach a climax if you are determined to be my wife my dear dear little suzanne i will elope with you she clapped her hands as all the charming adventures in the romances she had read occurred to her and cried oh what bliss when will you elope with me he whispered very low to-night where shall we go that is my secret think well of what you are doing remember that after that flight you must become my wife it is the only means but it is dangerous very dangerous for you i have decided where shall i meet you meet me about midnight in the place de la concorde i will be there he clasped her hand oh how i love you how brave and good you are then you do not want to marry marquis de cazolles oh no madame walter turning her head called out come little one what are you and bel ami doing they rejoined the others and returned by way of chateau when the carriage arrived at the door of the mansion madame walter 
pressed Georges to dine with them, but he refused, and returned home to look over his papers and destroy any compromising letters. Then he repaired in a cab with feverish haste to the place of meeting. He waited there some time, and thinking his lady-love had played him false, he was about to drive off, when a gentle voice whispered at the door of his cab, "'Are you there, bel ami? "'Is it you, Suzanne?' "'Yes.' Ah, get in she entered the cab and he bade the cabman drive on he asked well how did it all pass off she murmured faintly oh it was terrible with mamma especially your mamma what did she say tell me oh it was frightful I entered her room and made the little speech I had prepared. She turned pale and cried, Never! I wept, I protested that I would marry only you. She was like a madwoman. She vowed I should be sent to a convent. I never saw her like that, never. Papa, hearing her agitated words, entered. He was not as angry as she was, but he said you were not a suitable match for me. As they had vexed me, I talked louder than they, and papa with a dramatic air bade me leave the room. That decided me to fly with you, and here I am. Where shall we go? He replied, encircling her waist with his arm. It is too late to take the train. This cab will take us to Sèvres, where we can spend the night, and to-morrow we will leave for La Roche-Guillon. It is a pretty village on the banks of the Seine, between Mantes and Bonnières. The cab rolled on. Georges took the young girl's hand and kissed it respectfully. He did not know what to say to her, being unaccustomed to platonic affection. Suddenly he perceived that she was weeping. He asked in a fright, "'What ails you, my dear little one?' She replied tearfully, "'I was thinking that poor mamma could not sleep if she had found out that I was gone.' Her mother, indeed, was not asleep. When Suzanne left the room, Madame Walter turned to her husband and asked in despair, "'What does that mean?' "'It means that that intriguer has influenced her. It is he who has made her refuse Cazol. You have flattered and cajoled him too.' It was bel ami here, bel ami there, from morning until night. Now you are paid for it. I? Yes, you. You are as much infatuated with him as Madeleine, Suzanne, and the rest of them. Do you think that I did not see that you could not exist for two days without him? She rose tragically. I will not allow you to speak to me thus. You forget that I was not brought up like you in a shop." With an oath he left the room, banging the door behind him. When he was gone, she thought over all that had taken place. Suzanne was in love with bel -Ami, and bel -Ami wanted to marry Suzanne. No, it was not true. She was mistaken. He would not be capable of such an action. He knew nothing of Suzanne's escapade. They would take Suzanne away for six months, and that would end it. She rose, saying, 
i cannot rest in this uncertainty i shall lose my reason i will arouse suzanne and question her she proceeded to her daughter's room she entered it was empty the bed had not been slept in a horrible suspicion possessed her and she flew to her husband he was in bed reading she gasped have you seen suzanne no why she is gone she is not in her room with one bound he was out of bed he rushed to his daughter's room not finding her there he sank into a chair his wife had followed him well she asked he had not the strength to reply he was no longer angry he groaned he has her we are lost lost how why he must marry her now she cried wildly marry her never are you mad he replied sadly it will do no good to yell he has disgraced her the best thing to be done is to give her to him and at once too then no one will know of this escapade she repeated in great agitation never he shall never have suzanne overcome walter murmured but he has her and he will keep her as long as we do not yield therefore to avoid a scandal we must do so at once but his wife replied no no i will never consent impatiently he returned it is a matter of necessity ah oh, the scoundrel how he has deceived us but he is shrewd at any rate she might have done better as far as position but not intelligence and future is concerned he is a promising young man he will be a deputy or a minister some day madame walter however repeated wildly i will never let him marry suzanne do you hear never in his turn he became incensed and like a practical man defended bel ami be silent i tell you he must marry her and who knows perhaps we shall not regret it with men of his stamp one never knows what may come about you saw how he downed la roche mathieu in three articles and that with a dignity which was very difficult to maintain in his position as husband so we shall see madame walter felt a desire to cry aloud and tear her hair but she only repeated angrily he shall not have her walter rose took up his lamp and said you are silly like all women you only act on impulse you do not know how to accommodate yourself to circumstances you are stupid i tell you he shall marry her it is essential and he left the room madame walter remained alone with her suffering her despair if only a priest were at hand she would cast herself at his feet and confess all her errors and her agony he would prevent the marriage where could she find a priest where should she turn before her eyes floated like a vision the calm face of christ walking on the water as she had seen it in the painting he seemed to say to her 
come unto me kneel at my feet i will comfort and instruct you as to what to do she took the lamp and sought the conservatory she opened the door leading into the room which held the enormous canvas and fell upon her knees before it at first she prayed fervently but as she raised her eyes and saw the resemblance to bel ami she murmured jesus 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 while her thoughts were with her daughter and her lover she uttered a wild cry as she pictured them together alone and fell into a swoon when day broke they found madame walter still lying unconscious before the painting she was so ill after that that her life was almost despaired of monsieur walter explained his daughter's absence to the servants by saying to them that she had been sent to a convent for a short time then he replied to a long letter from duroy giving his consent to the marriage with his daughter bellamy had posted that epistle when he left paris having prepared it the night of his departure in it he said in respectful terms that he had loved the young girl a long time that there had never been any understanding between them but that as she came to him to say i will be your wife he felt authorized in keeping her in hiding her in fact until he had obtained a reply from her parents whose wishes were to him of more value than those of his betrothed georges and suzanne spent a week at la roche guillon never had the young girl enjoyed herself so thoroughly as she passed for his sister they lived in a chaste and free intimacy a kind of living companionship he thought it wiser to treat her with respect and when he said to her we will return to paris to-morrow your father has bestowed your hand upon me she whispered naively already this is just as pleasant as being your wife end of chapter 17 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter 18 of bel ami or the history of a scoundrel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown chapter eighteen attainment it was dark in the apartments in the rue de constantinople when georges du roi and clotilde de marelle having met at the door entered them without giving him time to raise the shades the latter said so you are going to marry suzanne walter he replied in the affirmative adding gently did you not know it she answered angrily so you are going to marry suzanne walter for three months you have deceived me every one knew of it but me my husband told me since you left your wife you have been preparing for that stroke and you made use of me in the interim what a rascal you are he asked how do you make that out 
i had a wife who deceived me i surprised her obtained a divorce and am now going to marry another what is more simple than that she murmured what a villain he said with dignity i beg of you to be more careful as to what you say she rebelled at such words from him what would you like me to handle you with gloves you have conducted yourself like a rascal ever since i have known you and now you do not want me to speak of it you deceive every one you gather pleasure and money everywhere and you want me to treat you as an honest man he rose his lips twitched be silent or i will make you leave these rooms she cried leave here you will make me you you forget that it is i who have paid for these apartments from the very first and you threaten to put me out of them be silent good for nothing do you think i do not know how you stole a portion of vaudrec's bequest from madeleine do you think i do not know about suzanne he seized her by her shoulders and shook her do not speak of that i forbid you i know you have ruined her he would have taken anything else but that lie exasperated him he repeated be silent take care and he shook her as he would have shaken the bough of a tree still she continued you were her ruin i know it he rushed upon her and struck her as if she had been a man suddenly she ceased speaking and groaned beneath his blows finally he desisted paced the room several times in order to regain his self-possession entered the bedroom filled the basin with cold water and bathed his head then he washed his hands and returned to see what clotilde was doing she had not moved she lay upon the floor weeping softly he asked harshly will you soon have done crying she did not reply he stood in the centre of the room somewhat embarrassed somewhat ashamed as he saw the form lying before him suddenly he seized his hat good evening you can leave the key with the janitor when you are ready i will not await your pleasure he left the room closed the door sought the porter and said to him madame is resting she will go out soon you can tell the proprietor that i have given notice for the first of october his marriage was fixed for the twentieth it was to take place at the madeleine there had been a great deal of gossip about the entire affair and many different reports were circulated madame walter had aged greatly her hair was grey and she sought solace in religion in the early part of september la vie francaise announced that baron du roi de cantel had become its chief editor m walter reserving the title of manager to that announcement were subjoined the names of the staff of art and theatrical critics political reporters and so forth journalists no longer sneered in speaking of la vie francaise its success had been rapid and complete 
the marriage of its chief editor was what was called a parisian event georges du roi and the walters having occasioned much comment for some time the ceremony took place on a clear autumn day at ten o'clock the curious began to assemble at eleven o'clock detachments of officers came to disperse the crowd soon after the first guests arrived they were followed by others women in rich costumes men grave and dignified the church slowly began to fill norbert de varenne espied jacques rival and joined him well said he sharpers always succeed his companion who was not envious replied so much the better for him his fortune is made rival asked do you know what has become of his wife the poet smiled yes and no she lives a very retired life i have been told in the montmartre quarter but there is a but for some time i have read political articles in la plume which resemble those of forestier and du roi they are supposed to be written by a jean le dull a young intelligent handsome man something like our friend georges who has become acquainted with madame forestier from that i have concluded that she likes beginners and that they like her she is moreover rich vaudrec and la roche mathieu were not attentive to her for nothing rival asked tell me is it true that madame walter and du roi do not speak yes she did not wish to give him her daughter's hand but he threatened the old man with shocking revelations walter remembered la roche mathieu's fate and yielded at once but his wife obstinate like all women vowed that she would never address a word to her son-in-law it is comical to see them together she looks like the statue of vengeance and he is very uncomfortable although he tries to appear at his ease suddenly the beadle struck the floor three times with his staff all the people turned to see what was coming and the young bride appeared in the doorway leaning upon her father's arm she looked like a beautiful doll crowned with a wreath of orange blossoms she advanced with bowed head the ladies smiled and murmured as she passed them the men whispered exquisite adorable m walter walked by her side with exaggerated dignity behind them came four maids of honour dressed in pink and forming a charming court for so dainty a queen madame walter followed on the arm of count de la tour evelyn's aged father she did not walk she dragged herself along ready to faint at every step she had aged and grown thinner next came georges du roi with an old lady a stranger he held his head proudly erect and wore upon his coat like a drop of blood the red ribbon of the legion of honour he was followed by the relatives rose who had been married six weeks with a senator 
Count de la Tour Yvelin with Viscountess de Persemur. Following them was a motley procession of associates and friends of Duroy, country cousins of Madame Walter's, and guests invited by her husband. The tones of the organ filled the church. The large doors at the entrance were closed, and Georges kneeled beside his bride in the choir. The new bishop of Tangiers, cross in hand, mitre on head, entered from the sacristy, to unite them in the name of the Almighty. He asked the usual questions. Rings were exchanged, words pronounced which bound them forever, and then he delivered an address to the newly married couple. The sound of stifled sobs caused several to turn their heads. Madame Walter was weeping, her face buried in her hands. She had been obliged to yield. But since the day on which she had told Duroy, You are the vilest man I know. Never speak to me again, for I will not answer you she had suffered intolerable anguish she hated suzanne bitterly her hatred was caused by unnatural jealousy the bishop was marrying a daughter to her mother's lover before her and two thousand persons and she could say nothing she could not stop him she could not cry, He is mine, that man is my lover, that union you are blessing is infamous. Several ladies, touched by her apparent grief, murmured, How affected that poor mother is! The bishop said, you are among the favoured ones of the earth. You, sir, who are raised above others by your talent, you who write, instruct, counsel, guide the people, have a grand mission to fulfil, a fine example to set. Duroy listened to him proudly. A prelate of the Roman Church spoke thus to him. A number of illustrious people had come thither on his account. It seemed to him that an invisible power was impelling him on. He would become one of the masters of the country. He, the son of the poor peasants of Canteleu. He had given his parents five thousand francs of Count de Vaudrec's fortune, and he intended sending them fifty thousand more. Then they could buy a small estate and live happily. The bishop had finished his harangue. A priest ascended the altar, and the organ pealed forth suddenly the vibrating tones melted into delicate melodious ones like the songs of birds then again they swelled into deep full tones and human voices chanted over their bowed heads vauri and landec of the opera were singing Bellamy, kneeling beside Suzanne, bowed his head. At that moment he felt almost pious, for he was filled with gratitude for the blessings showered upon him. Without knowing just whom he was addressing, he offered up thanks for his success. When the ceremony was over, he rose, and giving his arm to his wife, they passed into the sacristy. A stream of people entered. Georges fancied himself a king, 
whom the people were coming to greet he shook hands uttered words which signified nothing and replied to congratulations with the words you are very kind suddenly he saw madame de marelle and the recollection of all the kisses he had given her and which she had returned of all their caresses of the sound of her voice possessed him with the mad desire to regain her she was so pretty with her bright eyes and roguish air she advanced somewhat timidly and offered him her hand he took retained and pressed it as if to say i shall love you always i am yours their eyes met smiling bright full of love she murmured in her soft tones until we meet again sir and he gaily repeated her words others approached and she passed on finally the throng dispersed georges placed suzanne's hand upon his arm to pass through the church with her it was filled with people for all had resumed their seats in order to see them leave the sacred edifice together he walked along slowly with a firm step his head erect he saw no one he only thought of himself when they reached the threshold he saw a crowd gathered outside come to gaze at him georges du roi the people of paris envied him raising his eyes he saw beyond the place de la concorde the chamber of deputies and it seemed to him that it was only a stone's throw from the portico of the madeleine to that of the palais bourbon leisurely they descended the steps between two rows of spectators but georges did not see them his thoughts had returned to the past and before his eyes dazzled by the bright sunlight floated the image of madame de marelle rearranging the curly locks upon her temples before the mirror in their apartments end of chapter 18 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey end of bel ami or the history of a scoundrel by guy de maupassant translator unknown